You have a TV? No. I just like to read the TV guide. Read the TV guide. You don't need a TV. Hello and welcome. It's TV Guidance Counselor. And I am Ken Reed. I am your TV guidance counselor. As always, it is Wednesday. It is time for a brand new edition of the show. And as you may or may not be able to tell, I am very excited for this episode. As you may have seen when you downloaded it, it's a long one, but it's a good one. Uh, Although I, I will say, I don't think I've had any really long ones that were bad ones. In fact, I don't think I've had any episodes that were bad ones, but anyway, I digress. My guest today is the amazing Brenda Bennett, and Brenda was uh, probably best known for being in the Vanity Six and Apollonia Six, uh, the uh, sort of prince-protege groups that were uh, around during what many people think of as the golden age of prince, uh, the sort of Purple Rain era, and that is how I first noticed Brenda. Uh, She also has a long music career, and we talk about it here, you know, opening for Queen on their first tour and doing some great records recently and doing amazing stuff on television on you know with those groups and with on soul train and it's just we get into it you're gonna you're gonna really enjoy this one loved talking to brenda this is one of my favorite episodes i've recorded uh she's just absolutely great uh there's something for everybody here uh i as you know if you listen to the show frequently and if you don't because i'm gonna tell you i'm a huge fan of this year of prince and of brenda's music specifically so i'm gonna change it up a little bit bit here and instead of playing uh my normal theme song or normal sort of transitional music we're gonna play some of brenda's so we're gonna kick the episode off with brenda bennett and i'm gonna play maybe my favorite song by uh apollonia six uh which is uh one that brenda happens to sing and it's called blue limousine so we'll play a little bit of that into the interview and i'll be back at the end here so i think you'll enjoy this one very much sit back relax get a nice cup of something like coffee uh because it's a long one and listen to this week's episode of TV Guidance Counselor with my guest, the one and only Miss Brenda Bennett. Brenda Bennett, how are you? I'm fine. I'm wonderful. I'm, I'm so happy to be here. This is a lot of fun to be here looking at everything you've got to see. <laughs> She's slowly taking in all the uh, ephemera in the office. That um, <laughs> Yeah, I tried to keep it in just this room if possible, mm. uh, but it's, it spills out. Yeah, this is a lifetime of um, mid-century uh, nonsense that I've, <laughs> I've rescued from places. Well, you could never be bored in here. That's, that's true. Sure. You that's can always true. find something else to catch your attention and draw I think you I've, in. I think I've been planning for being snowbound for like two or three years or something that's a, that's this is a good place <laughs> to like, be yeah, for that, plenty for sure. to read you know if for some reason i'm at the top of a mountain and have to be the person that takes temperatures every day uh, so thank you so much for making the trek up here and uh you know i really wanted to talk to you because your your story and sort of your journey sort of absolutely fascinates me and i'm a big fan of all this stuff you've done over the years oh, thank you and when i found out you were from new england it it really amazed me <laughs> because i you know having grown up here i always sort of pay special attention to when other people are from here and then kind of get out and do things that are incredible <laughs> because right. it seems so far away from uh, the entertainment industry, or at least it, you know, growing up. I don't know if you found that. <laughs> well, growing up for me, um, especially was uh, becoming involved in the music business wasn't something I thought was attainable for me. Right. I just thought it was it was it was too far away and too big and too. Um, even though growing up in a, in a musical family. It wasn't that part of it. It was just, didn't think it was for me. Um, not that I didn't want to do something, but, um, I just, how could I be doing something like that? Yeah. See, I mean, even New York, which is very close, mm-hmm. <laughs> seems mm-hmm. really far away when you're growing up here. It's like, are you, you can't just go down there. I don't know what right. you, yeah. And you, you hear, you hear people, you know, making it, so-called making it from the Boston area or, you know, the big city areas, the Boston area, New York or something like that. And they right. go on into the, to the bigger, bigger scenes. And, um, but for myself, I just never thought that it was something that I would wind up doing. I didn't really have 
the desire to do it. I thought it would be fun. And I think probably another reason being having grown up with a musical situation, it wasn't something new. Music wasn't new to me. Right. It wasn't an escape from your family. Right. Yeah. Because it was my family. It was your family. <laughs> yeah. And um, so growing up with it, um, it's always been a part of me and it will always be a part of me. Right. Not only my roots of what I grew up with, um, my parents being country, my family being country musicians, but... Um, I could never imagine my life without it in any shape or form. You know? And so it wasn't like you have to go somewhere to get to sort of scratch that itch because you have it around you all the time. Right. And yeah. it didn't, it wasn't something, um, it was special, but not special where I felt that ambition to, this is what I want to do. You know, I wanted to be an artist and, and that's, that was my first love. And I was an artist and I am an artist. Music kind of fell in, in being able to become involved in the music industry fell in my lap. Really, I was one of those lucky people, and and I I was very blessed to have been able to fall into it in the way that I did. It was it was things that were offered to me in a way that I had friends that had been banging their heads for years and their fingers bleeding to the bone to to find a chance to get a chance and just working and and getting their chops, you know. And and here I'd never been in a band before in 1973 when I was picked to be in a local blues band that had just landed a a major recording label <laughs> contract with CBS Records. Step in after all the work you know? is done. <laughs> <laughs> it is, and they were they, I mean, they had already been working and they'd been doing this and whatnot and, and had a whole setup and uh, re received this contract and things happen funny in funny ways. You know, oh, yeah. you don't you, you just don't know what's going to happen. You, you can't plan that stuff. I feel like and no. that's and that's you know with comedy too. I have all these people like I got a five year plan. I'm going to do this and this and mm. this and then they tend to just not kind of peter out even if they're very good and it's mm -hmm. the people who kind of at the right place right time or were just like yeah i don't know just kind of happened <laughs> they said sure <laughs> so it sounds like you although you grew up in music and you see your parents were country musicians mm -hmm. you didn't quite f see it as yours until a, a very special moment on television when you when you first saw the beatles you were that's telling. right i really wasn't um i liked m the music uh, that my parents were doing and my mom between my mother and my father, my father was a pure country man. Is he from uh, the South, or did he? No, he's not. Um, but it just um, you don't have. It doesn't have a location, right? Really, my mom, uh, she she liked to mix things up a little bit more, right? You know, she liked other other genres of music, and and it was through her influence and from ex this, it, she she gave us the exposure of different things that there was different music out there besides just this country format, and and so we listened to things, and and I think for myself, and I still find this with me is that, you know, people will say who as an artist or what genre of music had the most influence on you, and I can't say that any one particular is or that I, I i lean towards any one particular for me it's good songs you know having had been able to listen to those different things i was exposed to a fabulous song by the kingston trio mm -hmm. you know or a fabulous song by um elvis presley you know it was that eclectic of a of, of, a, of a stew at the time and so i wasn't really quite sure that i needed to find my own music until on friday night i used to watch the jack parr show and I was looking in the TV guide. <laughs> you have so many TV oh, guides. Yeah, we were looking oh for gosh. the actual one, and I know it's here somewhere, but we couldn't <laughs> dig it up. So this is in, is in January 4th, I think, 1964. January 3rd, 1964. Yeah. yeah. Um, I opened up the TV guide. My best friend, Paula Green, was going to come over for an overnight, because it was Friday, it was the weekend, yeah, you know. I mean, it was, it off. Yeah. What are we going to do? And um, so I wanted to check and see, because I always like to try and see if there was musical things going on yep. at different shows, and I was hoping to see something uh, with Jack Parr. And um, it was in the TV Guide that there was going to be some. He was going to show some footage from a popular group from England called the Beatles, and I just couldn't believe it. The Beatles. I, I remember saying to my mom, "Mom, I, you know," and she's going, "What's going on?" And I, <laughs> I said, "Jack Parr's going to have a group called the Beatles." I mean, can you believe that name? I mean, how? Why? Who would ever do that? So the show came on. We were all excited to watch, and. I, when I, as soon as I heard their music and I saw the look and I just, um, it really struck me how the response from the audience, they showed the, the, the girl screaming in the audience oh, yeah. and going mental, going mental. Yeah. I, you're, I was beyond crazy. And, um, and I just sat there going, what are these girls doing? My God. And I'm listening to the music and, and I really felt the chicken skin 
Yeah. I got the chicken skin and I just said, this is okay. This is for me. And that's a uniquely uh, television moment as well, because mm-hmm. I'm sure, you know, I think The Place She Loves You was the song they did mm-hmm. and great song. And I'm sure that would have probably caught your ear if you heard it on the radio. But right. seeing it in that format with the context of mm-hmm. the, the girls going nuts and seeing their look, which was very different and right. the whole thing. It was starting the mod look from, yeah. from out of England. and it must um, have been that. And I hadn't heard package. them yet on the radio at that time. That was my very first time ever seeing or hearing them. And um, I used to, one of the things I used to love to do coming home from school was to be able to watch American Bandstand. Was it every day at like three o'clock or something? It was three or four o'clock. I remember that. And still at the time, I wasn't finding a, there were songs that I heard that I liked, music that I liked, and, but there wasn't anything that was grabbing me until I heard the Beatles. And it just, it stayed with me and it still stays with me. I hear a Beatles, the Beatles doing a number and I just immediately fall into the mode <laughs> yeah i mean you were probably in the exact sweet spot for the beatles too like age and and yeah it was just that was the exact music for you at that time I it imagine. was yes it and it was. makes sense that you would gravitate towards just songs younger as a someone who kind of grew up around country music because it and forgive me my ignorance of country this may be totally wrong but the tradition of country music was more about songs than songwriters or artists because right. people would would do the sort of the same songs and mm-hmm. a lot of people would do these sort of traditional songs mm-hmm. and it was more about the song than necessarily the person doing it or and it wasn't right. as much you didn't identify songs being written by people quite as much with that genre and then well one of the things too it's always been called the white man's blues yes and um there was a lot of a lot of the country music at the time was what we used to <laughs> we used to say sitting around the house was tears in your beer yes you know, kind oh of yeah stuff. yeah and um and but then there was the good things um there was the upbeat stuff too that were, were fun to listen to, and with the Beatles, one I think one of besides this, their sound, besides the the style of their music, I think one of the things that hit home with me too is that they were writing their own music, as opposed to having a plethora of writers writing music and you picking something or something being presented to you yeah. to try and do to to um, to record it. That drill building style that had been mm. from Tin Pan Alley and for decades mm-hmm. was completely broken down after that yeah and you had people going they wrote this this is them and it was thing. simplified there wasn't you know you, know, you had a, a two guitars a bass and drums and how much more simple can you get and, the, and i mean they they had three vocals they had three singers doing um you know a blend of vocals harmony notes and such that um it seems so simple but simple is not always easy i think that's what a, was a big attractive thing to me too is that they write their own songs and they're doing well and this is something that can, that is you know you can do and i wanted to do that i had started writing poetry and i thought that well, why don't i try and write a song but i needed to learn how to play an instrument too <laughs> yeah but not virtuoso though like that would seem to be the thing like prior to that if you wanted to do like phil specter wall of sound thing you probably had to have really great chops to be a songwriter right in a lot of ways but if you could play well enough to get your idea across mm-hmm, mm-hmm. now you wrote a song and that's a legitimate song right which was probably the big sea change there and i don't know why i wouldn't have seen that within the country music because country music was at that time so much more uncomplicated than it is right. now now it's kind of like tailgate music it, it's kind of <laughs> yes and it's it's just it's country rock it's yeah. um you know it's it's slick i mean this is great stuff about it i love you know people like keith urban and miranda lambert blake sheldon i love all those guys you know yeah. they have something to say and i like listening to them but i decided i wanted to learn to write i figured i could take my poetry and try and put it to music somehow but i didn't have any instrument I didn't have an instrument of my own. There was a guitar that was kicking around the house that was kind of for my brothers and I. Right. But, you know, to try and get FaceTime with the guitar, yeah. you know, I was sort of like having to fight two boys, you know. Like, Can I sign the guitar for next Tuesday? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> You're so right. And um, and I was always trying to sneak, sneak my father's guitar out of his case. Right. You know, and that one. was, oh, my God, you did not go near his guitar. You know, you weren't you weren't allowed to breathe on it. And um, But when he wasn't around, of course... <clears throat> He's passed away now. God bless him. But I don't know <laughs> if he ever knew that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm sure he probably knew it. <laughs> I tried to be clean and not make any marks on it. Yeah, you know. But um, he, um, my uncle, kind of took pity on us <laughs> and brought a guitar over for us to play. It was something that he'd had laying around the house. It was an old Martin to be laying around the house and to <laughs> give to his niece and nephews. You know, I didn't realize it at the time. And you say carving the guitar time oh yeah we carved into the body of that guitar (laughs) 
I can't, you know. The things like, people let kids just <laughs> mess know, around just, with, yeah. You know, and this was a, you know, a 50s Martin that, oh my God. So, um, and I, I was trying to figure out how am I going to learn it? So I asked my dad if he would teach me how to play. And it was kind of a thing in the family. Nobody, ra- my mother was the only one that knew how to read music. I don't know how to read music. And yet I write songs. And so he said, I'll teach you one thing. <laughs> he taught me how to play a C chord. And then like, you figure out the rest. And that's there. pretty much what it was. Yeah. You want to, you want to learn how to play? Go for it. You know, and, and uh, you're on your own kind of thing. And it worked. And it worked. But at the same <laughs> time, I, I was figuring out, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I saved up my 50 cent allowance, weekly allowance. And I was able to get my hands on some Beatles song books that had the chord changes to the songs. Mm-hmm. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I yeah. can do this myself yeah, now? And it was just like, and that's all I did was I closed myself in my bedroom. And that's all I did. Just over and over and over. over and went over to school. And, and learned, learning. And it, so I learned chord changes on the guitar. You know, I still, I play things on the guitar. I'll say, I'll turn around and say to my buddy Ed here who's with us today. Um Ed, what's this? <laughs> yeah, what's I this chord? I don't know what I'm playing, but I know what it sounds like when I put my fingers there. So yeah. I'm going to use it in this part of the song. And, and so that's strong structure as well, without mm-hmm. really trying, because right. you're kind of getting how the stuff comes together, right? Just by practicing it, listening to it, and playing it. So it's, I feel like that kind of lesson. If someone sat down and said, "I'm diagramming a song. It goes this, this, and this," you probably would just go, "I don't know," you know, it's boring. Yeah. yeah. But if you just play it and you go, "No, I get how a song." fits together now. right exactly and i um and the repetition of it and the discipline of just and i didn't look at it as discipline at the time but that's pretty much what i did is i formed my own discipline with it and i shut out the world and when i got behind my bedroom door and that was my world was yeah. to to learn chord changes learn the beatles songs and learn how i could apply it to writing my own songs with the poetry i wrote did your brothers go into music or they my brothers didn't... did go into music um i was a middle child between a younger and older brother. My older brother is an incredible bass player. He's he's the the, uh, the bass player on the disc that I gave you. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, fabulous. My younger brother was a guitar player. Um, he passed away two thousand two um, unexpectedly, and he and I he and I used to write. He was incredibly good. Um, would come up with these commercial hooks, uh, just unbelievable. And he, had he a and melody I, sense that yeah, was, yeah, he and I wrote. We used to write some things together. Bruce and I have worked together before in the past, and we're working uh, together again now, doing oh, cool. some things, yeah. And Brian and I would would um, get together. We He and I never worked together on stage, but um, we would write some tunes from time to time. So you were also saying that you were watching um, Ozzy and Harriet all the time mm. because you liked Ricky Nelson, mm-hmm. which I'm sure who didn't mm. at the time, but mostly because he'd do songs. Yeah, it was. I watched the show. The show was a good show. I, I mean, there was a whole little um, pocket at that time. It was Ozzy and Harriet, Donna Father Reed. Knows Best, the Donna Reed show. Yeah, um, all those shows, and it was like a, they showed a euphoric way of life in, yeah. in a lot of respects, you know. And perfect suburban America. Yeah, yeah. and um, and so I thought growing up at the time that that's the way life was supposed to be. Right, you know. And, then you get older and really find out what's, you know. <laughs> Nobody's life is actually, it's more like the Monsters <laughs> uh, at best or, you know, if you're wealthy, the, the Adams, Adams family. family. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, like anything, it's what you make of it too. Yeah. You know? So, um, but what a weird format too, because Ozzy and Harriet was such a huge show that it was a traditional sitcom, but they, yeah. they could do anything they wanted. Right. And they'd be like, no, our son's going to play a song. <laughs> well, the thing that was crazy that I, I, I learned um, about, about Ozzy and Harriet as well as too, is he was a band leader. Yeah. So he's very involved with music. And I think Harriet, he met Harriet as she came in as a singer. I'm not, I believe I, I, I don't yeah, want to say 100% sure on yeah, that, yeah, but yeah. I think that was the case. And so there was already a musical thing going on with the family. And then they, they did this sitcom show of, you know, and the only thing that was musically, um, even touched on was, and I don't, I don't recall that Ricky Nelson, um, was part of the show uh, within the story. Yeah, I don't during think the he show. was either. He just got, they would kind mm-hmm. of break character a lot, mm-hmm. or like come in and out of a commercial, which I guess people were used to at that time because that was the tail end of the, um, you know, sponsorships. Where like in the middle of the sitcom, right. they'd kind of look at the camera and be like, "And this is Brill Cream," and, you know, in the middle <laughs> of the show. So people were a, weirdly a little more used to the kind of stuff now. People would think he's very postmodern and you know, mm. fourth wall breaking, but it was pretty standard uh, for the time. And yeah, I think. 
you know, having not seen Ozzy and Harriet that recently, it, it would be just kind of like, we're, we're the real Ozzy and Harriet, not yeah. the and here's our son. Right. And so that the, he would do a number, not, and it wasn't every show. Right. It, from time to time, he would do a number. And I, I used to watch it just to see if he was going to do a show. Great I, way to get kids to watch the show every week. Yeah. <laughs> and um, then I, I was blessed to be able to work with him. Yeah, that's later that's on. the craziest part. Well, there's probably crazier things actually. But and that, the, and it was just by chance. It wasn't something I I searched for. It oh, wasn't you didn't? Something, no, I had we Apollonia Six um, did a, a project after the Purple Rain uh, move, movie had come out and everything. We did a a major project. It was a sort of mini movie project where uh, there was four or five of the songs off the album that we t- that was taken and. A storyline was created around it, and um, we acted it out in the old Warner Brothers studios in Hollywood. Yep. And, Burbank. Um, yeah. And um, it was going to be a promotional tool, and I thought at the time, this is a fantastic idea for a promotional tool. Nobody else had done it. Yeah, it's like a video album. Yeah. And uh, with the onset of MTV and everything, it just thought, oh, God. Uh, you know, I, I was curious to, to, to think of, okay, how where is this going to play? How is this going to play? I mean, where are we going to be able to show this you know yeah. um is it something that we might be able to do as a special on mtv or something like that and it was cute we had a lot of fun with it it was hard it was i was doing 14 hour work days for like seven days in a row wow. eight days in a row with this and i was exhausted i couldn't even i couldn't even talk and people would <laughs> ask me a question and i just start whimpering and yeah like, blah, blah, blah. i can't what what do you want can we just go back to touring you know, every like, day it's uh, easier uh, yeah. <laughs> Put me in the studio. But like Buck Henry is in it, and it Buck was right Henry's after he it. had um, come yeah. off Lauren Michaels' new show, which was his attempt to sort of recreate Saturday Night Live. I remember seeing the the video for um, Sex Shooter in it, mm-hmm, which mm-hmm. sort of flips that song on its head a little bit, yeah. where it's all about consumerism and, yeah. and uh, like Buck Henry's <laughs> in a bed that's a big barcode, and, yep. and everything says like <laughs> buy this and all that stuff, mm-hmm. which really changes the meaning of Sex the perceived shooter. meaning of that song i'm yeah. sure well we kind of had to do that a little bit too yeah. at the time because it was still we had made some inroads you know for a lot of the people that came after us mm-hmm. you know like beyonce and a lot of a lot of the female artists but at that time we were still pretty much um we had to be careful right in a lot of ways so we had to try and find some way to be able to utilize getting the material out there and you know instead of trying to shove things down people's throats yeah you know, like say you're gonna like it whether you like it or not but also kind of being like we know mm-hmm. we're kind of in on the whole thing here. right like yeah it's, yeah we're and not loosen up yeah, yeah we're not being exploited we we know we're doing yeah, this step is out of your comfort zone and open Cause, up because let's sort of back up how did we've we've missed how you get from Loving the Beatles, writing your own songs, <laughs> to being in a in a warehouse in, in in Warner Brothers filming a mini movie with Ricky Nelson and Buck Henry. <laughs> it's a big jump. Hey, there is a big jump. <laughs> I um you know, I stayed with music. Um the Beatles were were first and foremost in, in in my heart where music was concerned for me and my type of music per se for many years and I had learned to play and was becoming it was I was venturing out finding some other things that were becoming popular at the time I remember in the 70s later in the 60s and I was getting older where I was leaving the home fort and going a little further afield yeah. and I used to go to Brown University on the weekends Paul and I would hop a bus and we'd go to Brown University looking for live music because that was one of the things that started happening an awful lot too is bands being formed i mean with the beatles it, it, it exploded so many things in so many ways for so many people in the music within the music yeah, scene just you like know? you other people went we can do this yeah exactly and and so there was a lot of live music that was out there and that's what we would do on on a saturday was, is hop a bus and go to providence see if we could we'd walk the streets to the east side just listening just to listen <laughs> yeah. exactly just to listen to see if we could find you know some place that somebody was playing and RISD was probably kind of really amping up at that time too uh with the art stuff and because like talking heads mm-hmm. formed at RISD that's in right. the early 70s and that's right uh, a lot of really strange um and interesting bands that later moved to new york but right. became looked at as new york bands right but actually kind of germinated in providence yeah exactly one particular time that, that stands out in my mind the most and this was um, another another pivotal moment for me in music, and that was um, there had been a big sort of uh, concert series one afternoon at Brown University outside. I remember James Taylor played. There was a moment where we were waiting for the next artist to come on stage, 
And there was this woman that guy, that came on the stage and standing there talking to somebody. You could see her, but she was kind of off to the side. And I'm, she caught my eye because she had beautiful long red hair. And I'm looking at her and I'm looking and I'm, and I'm, you know, trying to think, who is this person? And what is she all about? And why is she on stage? And she's talking to that guy and I'm trying to figure that, you know, like, what? She's not a roadie. Yeah, she's not. <laughs> you know, I didn't know a roadie was yeah, at the yeah. time, but you know, I'm trying to think, who is she? What is she doing here? You know? And then other people started coming on the stage, these guys, and they started getting behind the instruments, you know, picking up instruments and things like this. And she reached over and she picked up an electric Stratocaster guitar. <laughs> And I'm thinking, my first thought was, oh, what is she doing with that guy's guitar? She's stealing it. <laughs> because at that time, Ken, most of the women... Were Joni Mitchell-y type they stuff? They were acoustic guitar, folky playing, yeah. kind of, you know, the, you know, you didn't see women picking up an electric Stratocaster, right. you know? And I'm, and I'm, my eyes are starting to bug out of my head. And I'm thinking, what is she doing? She puts it on and she gets up to the microphone and starts to say hello to the audience and she's playing the guitar. <laughs> And, you know, she's into a song or two, and next thing I know, she picks up a slide and starts playing slide guitar. And and I just, I, I lost it. It was Bonnie Raitt. I, you know, that was where the other thing, too, is um, going out and searching and looking and being exposed and looking to to find other things. Uh, with the onset of, of the Beatles and the interest that I had in them, I also became... Uh, obviously interested in the other things that were coming out of England at the time. So right. the whole Mercy beat, you know, Jerry and the Pacemakers and Herman's Hermits and um, Dave Clark Five. I love Dave Clark Five. In fact, when I lived in England, I um, recorded in Dave Clark's studio. That's great. Utopia. Yes. Yeah, when did what years did you live in England? Um, it was right after the Purple Rain tour. In that in that period of time. It's a pretty exciting time to live over there too, mm. as musically especially. There was a lot of interesting, innovative stuff coming out yeah. um, in the mid to late '80s in England that we didn't get here for probably a decade or two. It, it always happens that way. I was, but I, you know, I wasn't listening to folk music. I wasn't listening. I was listening to a little bit of Joni Mitchell. I wasn't listening to Joan Baez. My folk folky girlfriends will say to me ah oh, don't you know this song don't you know that one when i was 17 i said no i was listening to john mayle and yeah. you know and and rod stewart stuff and eric clapton and people like that you know and, yeah you know i kind of graduated to a different when fleetwood mac was a blues band <laughs> exactly you know <laughs> blood one pig yeah yeah ed and i were talking about king crimson uh, first time you ever heard of mellotron in the united states was yeah. they were here we were just talking about that um we, i saw him at the old uh, tea party oh wow I, we came up to see um, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. On the same show with and King Crimson? The, and King Crimson was the group that opened up. Wow. I mean, I'm, I'm surprised Captain <laughs> Beefheart wasn't thrown into the mix on that one either. The Boston Tea Party it comes up every so often on the show, but like the Velvet Underground was just like mm -hmm. always playing at the Boston Tea Party. That's, here. Yeah. Like just really weird yeah. things that I, I, I forget the exact quote, but someone says about the Velvet Underground that uh, not a lot of people bought their records, but everyone that did started a band that sold like a million records because oh, it was like yeah. and they would play these shows here and there's there's every boston or new england musician that i speak to has a story about seeing like them somewhere and just being like yep that was it i just i did it the next day i was gonna be in a band immediately after that there was nobody there um so you you could actually go see these people yeah which was pretty exciting that was one of the well that and that was one of the great things about the Boston area, too. I remember um, Sunset Series on the Commons, and there was a lot of free music to be had to listen to. I mean, if you, even if you didn't pay your five or six dollars for you could the ticket, it. <laughs> you, could, you could get close enough to where you could still listen and look through the fence or something, you know. But um, Did you remember the 1968 show with um, James Brown, just that infamous show? They aired it on PBS at the time, but it's there's a documentary that came out recently about the night James Brown saved Boston. It was the night Martin Luther King was shot. Were you aware of that at no, all at the time? No, I didn't. It's a really good documentary. Wow. It's, it's the night he was playing the Boston Garden and uh, he passed because it's 1968 it's right. i mean this is james brown in his prime and it was the night martin luther king was shot and the mayor of boston basically came to the show and came backstage to jim brown and was like 
you have to stop this city from being burned down oh. you need to go out there and talk to everybody and it, it's just it's crazy so there wasn't right yeah okay. it was just like absolutely Keep, insane wow um, i didn't know that yeah so it's, it's a it's a great documentary and the story i'd the, like the, to see that it's really good the concert's amazing too i mean it's it's if you want to see james brown at the height of his powers <laughs> it's a good show but also given the context it's pretty scary <laughs> living in yeah. america i uh in boston you know would get had kind of a reputation at the time for not being very um welcoming to black artists maybe but he's playing the boston garden that's a that's a big venue it sure was yeah um the beatles were a little too big to play it they played suffolk downs instead i was there uh, you were at the suffolk Downs show yes i was wow yeah was it the first time you had seen them it's the first and only time i saw them it was, that it, just it was funny there was a couple of times in my life where i had come to during when i was in high school there it wasn't unusual for myself and my friends to hop in the 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 beat the Volkswagen Beetle, which you have to have, and to drive to New York City for a cup of coffee, and we'd get there, you know, at four o'clock in the morning or something like this, and sleep in Central Park for a little bit for a couple of hours, and then get up and wander around and and whatnot. And I remember one time being in the village, don't remember if it was East Village, West Village, but it was certainly Greenwich Village somewhere, and sitting outside of a little shop where we just bought like a croissant and a cup of coffee, and Very sophisticated, nice and who comes walking around the corner? was George Harrison. Really? <laughs> yes. He was with two people that definitely looked like some kind of a bodyguard. Yeah. You know, I'm, as I imagine you have to, got, you know, but I remember he had blue jeans on. He had a blue sort of work shirt on. His hair was really long. And I think he had a beard at the time, and t- but there was no mistake. And as soon as I saw him, I knew exactly who he was. Did you freak out? Like, and he's, you? he was across the street and the streets weren't that wide being right. the, in the area of the village that we were in. And, um, he's across the street and I just uh, honed right in and, and he's, and he must have picked up on a vibe or something because he's walking and he, as soon as he gets close to us, he turns around and he looked right at me and I just smiled. And I just kind of did a little, you know, yeah, sort of. I t- know. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, then there was another time that, was it Paul? It was Paul McCartney that I got to see when I was living in England. I wow. went into a shop called um, Check and Speak. Okay. And a very, very small shop. And um, they do different scents for, um, like, colognes and mm-hmm. bath oils and things like this. And I was in, it was over by, um, it was over by Bond Street in London. And I used to like to go in there from time to time, and, and I used to purchase a few of their items. And I was in there, and I was looking, I was in this one section of the store, and I was looking at the stuff, and I was really engrossed in what I was looking at. And I could see a, a man's hand come into my view in front of me, and all of a sudden I heard this... Liverpoolian, <laughs> very familiar, accent, you know, saying to me, "What do you think? Do you think Linda would like something like this?" And I looked up, and it was Paul McCartney right in front of me. <laughs> but you kept your cool, I, I, as best as I could. Yeah, and I just, um, I giggled. I started yeah. giggling. Oh yeah, some of that's so think, surreal. You know, like you know, he's asking me this. I yeah. mean, out of the clear, I have anybody in the shop. You know, I happen to look up, and he's right in front of my face. And and it wasn't much of a conversation, but still counts it's still yeah it still was i got to look at him eye to eye face to face within a couple of feet of each other and and had words with them and you did know. you think linda would like it um <laughs> i didn't like it okay and All that's right. what i said to him i says well i'm not i don't fancy that one but maybe she will i said you know her better than i do <laughs> why are you asking me i don't know <laughs> buy both you have a lot of money <laughs> so there, that was it, it was such a thrill for me living in in england and working in the music business to begin with you know and thinking about that period of my life, of the you know, how much influence I had, you know, from the Beatles of uh, with songwriting and such, and to be in England and this place, something I had always wanted. Or yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, did it live up was to going to work to for me? Well, that was the thing too. You know, you um, I experienced being an alien in another country. You think that English speaking people, you know, you were going to do all right with. It's different, and it is different. It's definitely there. different. But the attitude towards Americans, I was a little taken aback. Yeah, it was. So I lived there in the early 2000s and I did the same thing. You know, I grew up just really loving all this British music and television stuff. And the, my sort of Beatles moment was seeing the show, The Young Ones and the band The Damned was on that show. Oh. And I was like, I don't know what this is, but this is what I like. <laughs> it was like that <laughs> moment. And so I, I went to school over there. I liked it. It's, it's different. And, and there, there's a people there don't really get that America is so huge because England's so small. There, yeah. there is sort of a more of a camaraderie or more of a um, a national sort of outlook on things than mm-hmm. we have here. Mm-hmm. And so 
yeah, everybody kind of thinks it's New York or Texas. Right. And so when you're kind of not in either one of those, they're like, I don't understand. Right. And I started doing comedy there for uh-huh. the first time. And it was right when the Iraq war broke out. Uh-huh. And they wouldn't introduce me as American. They had to say I was Canadian. Oh. And I oh. thought it was a joke. And then one night I insisted and I couldn't even get a word out. I just got nonstop booed. Oh my god. It was like a really weird Fancy that. Oh wake up gosh. call. But at the same time I'm like, this is the show this is the alley where the Ziggy Stardust photo is and this is you know, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's not exactly what you think it's gonna be. It's still pretty great over there. <laughs> and I have my father my grandfather was born and raised in England and immigrated over with his family, you know, through Ellis Island and all, um in the early nineteen hundreds. So I felt that I had a kinship and um, I did all right. I didn't have any tense moments with people because I, I, I try to stay out of that. And as it happens, I don't know if it happened with you, I, having an ear for things, you know, sounds, music or otherwise, it's hard for me to be around somebody with any kind of an accent. You absorb it. And I absorb it. I mean, if if Rachel and I were sitting together for for an hour's worth of talk, and I probably would have, by the end of that hour, I'd be signing like her. So I tried to blend in. My Boston accent got bad Ooh. when I was there, which was, I, I don't really speak with a very pronounced accent. No, Boston you don't accent, sound like it at all. But, and that was, you know, I had to work for that, uh, mostly just because if you're doing comedy or any sort of performance and you instantly go up there and you're like, how you doing? Why you? you know, like people have a certain, you know, and I just did, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, so I don't speak with the Boston accent, but when I was there, it got really bad. Wow. And I think it was just because the London-y sound was similar enough. There's a lot of different accents within London yeah, itself. Yeah. Too. And I was like, I guess like a Cockneyish thing sort of boss. Like they're dropping this. <laughs> so my brain just like defaulted to whatever the closest thing was. Wow. But when I got back, I was talking like Goodwill Hunting or something and uh-huh. nobody noticed because <laughs> they were just like, oh, you're just talking like a normal person now, which is very weird. <laughs> my, my family went nuts when I first came back because I spoke very quietly. Yeah. I was very quiet. And my brother still to this day will say, speak up, speak up. Right. And um and I brought the accent back with me for a while. I had to kind of curb that. It was the first band that really did anything of national note that blues band that you joined that had just got the yoke? No, they have they were there's there's been um surprisingly enough there have been a number of other musical um things that have come out of Rhode Island that um has made a name of themselves. Um Scott Hamilton is mm-hmm. a very well known jazz saxophonist. He's from Rhode Island. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the only jazz people that I like. Um, and I don't, I don't care for that much jazz. I don't like the real play, see how fast I can play my instrument kind of jazz. Yeah. As crazy as I can. Yeah. My favorite quote about that is that's the kind of music that's more fun for the people playing it than the people listening to it. True. <laughs> I agree. Wadsworth Mansion, um, with Sweet Mary. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're from Rhode Island. One of the guys I worked with that was with that group for a while, Tony oh, wow. Foley, um, Beaver Brown. Oh yeah, from, John Carradine, the Beaver Brown band, um, did really well with the the soundtrack stuff for Eddie, uh, and, the Eddie and the Cruisers. Yeah, that was, the that was big hit. Yeah, Ken Lyon and Tombstone Blues Band. When they got the CBS contract, that was his fifth major label. Wow. For him, he started in the folk scene back in the sixties. Wow. He was on Decca. He was on on a number of different things. His his first love was blues Mm -hmm. and he decided to put a blues thing together and he had he had a lot of different incarnations of tombstone i had done i had learned a lot of vocal stuff uh, being in choirs and choruses and things like this Mm -hmm. and i had an ear for it um so it was it was more natural to me to, to be able to do it i was on a backpacking trip in europe with my boyfriend at the time and a few friends of ours and i was gone for up to five months Wow. And when they when they had received this contract, part of the lineup was two girls. One of the girls did switch off to sing and lead with Ken and sang background vocals otherwise. And they had another girl who sang just strictly background vocals. And um, from one reason or another, after they were signed, she left the group. So they were in a flurry to try and find somebody to, to replace her because Charles Cobbleman, who signed them at the time, wanted that lineup. He right. wanted the lineup that That's he saw. That's what he signed. That's what he saw. That's what he heard. That's what he wanted. And he was in as the president of the CBS Records from Clive, because Clive Davis was in a lot of trouble with the cocaine right. problems. So, um, Sibylla Hyde, beautiful girl, beautiful voice. She and I were friends and had been friends. We'd never worked together musically because I'd never been in a band before. Right, but, right. But we were, we were certainly knew each other from around the area. And, um, so she would hear me. I would go, we'd take breaks and then we'd go in the house and I'd grab her guitar and I'd start playing and singing along with stuff and everything. So she, she heard my voice and knew I could sing. And, um, Ken was never one for, 
go into the local musicians union to to find somebody right. out of the roster of people to to fill in. He wanted word of mouth. He wanted a friend of a friend. He wanted somebody that was going to be a little close to home in that way. Because you got to work with them. It's not just a voice. It's mm -hmm. not a, um, you know, you're not hiring a plumber. All right. You basically have to live with them. And that's kind of how they looked at <laughs> yeah. it, too. Yeah, exactly. So this, and, you know, they just landed this, this contract, you know, so it was just... They wanted somebody that was going to be able to be a part of the family. And uh, she remembered me. They tried to contact me, but I was never in one place at the, long yeah. enough to, to be able to be contacted. This is not cell phone days. No. We're in Europe and probably parts of Europe that have like a phone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, when I finally got back, I landed in the United States with one American dime in my pocket. <laughs> no job, no place to live, with one American dime. And I used it to call my mother collect. <laughs> To say I'm 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 back in the country. Can I come home for a little while? <laughs> you know, and just kind of get Go my feet up underneath sleep me here. Somewhere. That's when I found out. She had told me, so oh, Sibylla, some girl named Sibylla Hyde's been trying to reach you, and something to do with music." And I, and I went, "Hmm, I wonder what that could be." <laughs> this may sound promising. And so I didn't know how to reach her, and and hope that she would call, and and she did. She did finally call again, and my ha my parents' house, and I happened to be home at the time, and I was offered the gig wow. to sing background vocals with this band that just got this contract she's going in on the phone you know well we just got this contract with cbs records and i'm like whoa whoa, whoa. <laughs> there's a lot of information you know, here yeah. you know and i'm going what the heck and I, at the time i had had some really crazy experiences backpacking around uh, i bet europe that by the time i got home i was 20 i was 21 years old and by the time i got home i figured I was ready for anything. I could do it. You know, give me life. I can do it. Yeah. So looking at my prospects of no job and <laughs> no place of my own to live and no money, I thought, well, what have I got to lose? Yeah. You literally just spent your last dime. Really? <laughs> 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 so I said, well, yeah, I'm going to try. And um, they were doing a, a gig at the Yellow Kittens on Black Island. Mm -hmm. And Kenny said, come down. Let's check out things out and let's see how you do. No rehearsals. <laughs> Kenny didn't believe in rehearsals. It was jump in, get your feet wet. Let's do it. Sink or swim. Exactly. Prince was kind of the same way. I bet. <laughs> and um, so I went down and um, just, I didn't even know the material. I didn't even know what songs they were going to play. <laughs> it's like backing up Chuck Berry. And <laughs> <laughs> he just shows up and you got to go with it. <laughs> yeah. And so um, I, it was a sink or swim moment and I swam. Yeah. And he liked it. And uh, liked me, liked my look, liked like the. And I think the the final clincher was asked if I wrote any songs. And I said, Well, I got a couple of songs, and I played him this one song that he said you're in. And that song wound up being uh, the last song on the first side of the album. Wow! It's a song called Hold Me Closer, and it's a little bit of a country ditty, country folky kind of ditty. It, we didn't use the full band to to back up back it up. A lot of vocal on it. Um, a lot of different vocal on it and, um, guitars, um, and there's a bass guitar in there, no drums. And, um, I still get people asking me. That was in 1973 and I yeah. still get people asking for that song. And that was probably in like a big studio. It was Electric to... Lady Studio yeah, in New York I mean, City. That's, if it's, you know, a huge label like that at the time, you're going to yeah. a legit <laughs> studio to do yeah. that thing. And you, I imagine, had not been in one like that prior to I'd that. never been in a yeah. studio. <laughs> so you go in a studio and you go into the studio. <laughs> the studio. It couldn't be, you know, CBS Records studio yeah. of their own in New York somewhere. It had to be Jimi Hendrix Electric Lady <laughs> Studio. Yeah. It's a lot of pressure. This was really something big. <laughs> yeah. So everything after that, probably a little bit easier to take, I imagine. I, you know, a part of me felt like, I don't deserve to be here. What am I doing here? But the other part of me said, do it. Yeah. Go with it. Do the best that you possibly can in it because you've been blessed to be handed this opportunity and um, just do the best you can. But you still had to deliver. Like you, you, mm -hmm. you might have got lucky getting to the door, but right. you still had to have something to sell when you got there. You know, well, you I, could... I know. And there's a lot of people at the time used to say, "So, oh well, it's it's who you know, huh?" You know. But you know, I found out, Ken, that it doesn't matter who you know if you don't have what you know. When it, when you come in front of somebody that's who you that becomes a who you know, you've got to have a, a, something 
to be worth being there. Oh yeah. I started my that's where I got that's where I cut my teeth and that's when I started building my chops and learning uh, the other whole aspect of actual performing and it was a real big learning experience. And a lot of touring and a lot yeah. of touring. The first tour we did to promote the album was in uh, April of 1974. We opened for Queen and Mapa Hoople. Wow. For a whole tour? Yeah. And that's actually it wasn't the full tour. We we did a number of dates with took them. a leg. Um, we took a leg, took a break, had to go off and do other things, Queen and then was pretty went big back in on a 1974. But they weren't. In, that was the first time in this country. Okay, they weren't big. In, they were starting to build some interest in this country, but they right. hadn't toured yet here. So they were still doing clubs. They were doing. Um, well, having lived in England, um, you know, back then at that time, there wasn't really a club circuit. Like yeah, we have here, it's like small theater that you could have. I mean, there was a pub circuit, right? But it let's face it, thing. Queen wasn't actually the type of, you know, yeah. Pub uh, rock was like the one on the Stranglers, you know, like pubs, yeah, yeah. And um, they had just done uh, the thing of it was is they we they put us out with Martha Hoopo, and because they, they needed to put us out, they were releasing the album. They had to put us out on tour to promote this thing, mm -hmm. and they didn't really have anybody in. Uh, their stable, perhaps, they had just signed Warner Brothers. I mean, not Warner Brothers, excuse me. They had just signed Aerosmith at the same time they signed us. Right. So, but Aerosmith, they couldn't put us out together. Which would have made right, sense yeah, because musically. Not, neither of us, they didn't know how we were going to do. Right. You know, so it was like, you can't, you know. So, um, they had to pull somebody out of the hat. And it happened to be Martha Hoople. Who were kind of at the tail end of their Well, success. they were their, their their hit song at the time was All the Young Dudes. Right. That yeah. Bowie wrote for that them Bowie kind wrote of for them, yeah. as a after they'd already sort of come up and were kind of Right. Down, Nick Ronson so wasn't playing with yeah. them anymore. Um Ariel Bender had come in to to, right. to fill his shoes. And um but they what had happened was they had done it they'd just completed doing a very successful European tour. Mm -hmm. And Queen was on the bill with them. And it was so good, and things had gone so well that when it was time for them to come over to do the, the, the American leg of the tour, they insisted that Queen come with them. And otherwise, they weren't going to do the tour. Right. They so, Mother Hoople headlined, Queen was the, the feature act, and you guys were opening? And we were opening, yes. Wow. And um, I remember it was my mother's birthday, April 16th, was the first show of that tour. <laughs> and it was in Denver, uh, Colorado. They'd flown us out to Denver a couple of days ahead of time to get used to the you know, to, for rehearsals, yeah, and to get used to the um, the thin air and and whatnot, and which weirdly does make a difference. It does. I for, I went to an Asp the Aspen Comedy Festival out there, and I thought that was all like an old wives' tale. And I remember I walked up a flight of stairs, and I was like, <gasps> <laughs> I was like I guess it's true. Wait a minute, I can't. Smoke. Can't imagine singing. I remember the first day of rehearsal, we'd done our bit. And, um, you know, there's all these people milling around and we're kind of wondering, well, who's that one? And who's this one? And, um, our drummer, Squeaky Quinn, he and I were sitting on the bleachers because we were at a, at a university. So Queen were coming onto the stage. And there was four of them. Roger's behind the drum, tinka ta 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 ta, and doing his bit. And Brian picks up the guitar and he's doing his bit and all this sort of thing. They just immediately, I can't remember what song it was. I'm sorry. <laughs> Let's say it's Don't Cold Crazy just for the sake of argument. That probably <laughs> very well could have been because that opening vocal, yeah. Stone Cold Crazy. Oh, yeah. And, um, that, their vocal was just, I'm, between the sound of Roger's voice and the sound of Brian's voice and the sound of Freddie's voice, it was just a blend that was just killer. Yeah. Queen. And nothing sounded like oh that. Oh, my God. You know, and Squeaky and I were sitting there and we were just kind of milling, you know, hanging the head, sort of wondering and moseying and wondering what this is going to be all about. And they hit that vocal and we fell off. <laughs> freaking bleachers, mate. <laughs> what is this? You know, and we, whoa, became fans immediately right then and there. And, um, and it was a great tour. It was a fun tour. Yeah. Cause within a couple, like uh, maybe two years, Queen was an arena band in America. Oh my God. <laughs> very quickly. They after exploded. That. Yeah. Yes, they did. They exploded. And, and they had a very cutting edge, um, couple of videos that came out that had never yeah. been done before as well. And Which was before videos were airing here. Mm -hmm. Because Top of the Pops, which had been on in the UK for 25 years by that point, had to show something. Yeah. And bands on tour or in America would send them videos. Right. So it, they had sort of that British format of, um, you know, uh, Bohemian Rhapsody, which mm -hmm. ended up becoming a huge video again in the 90s post Wayne's World was made in like 1977 or something, right. uh, you know, five or six years before MTV was even on the air. Right. And the only person who was American person who was really doing videos was Michael Nesmith, who had made a, oh, a yeah. he made a video album. Yeah. Called, um, uh, Elephant Parts. 
Okay. Which was a video album. And he would literally go to local news stations Mm -hmm. and just try to sell videos to show like between things. Right. (laughs) Which is a crazy way. Like I got a little (laughs) suitcase full of videos. So yeah, it's, it was, it was very unusual to have a visual time. Yeah. That character. But at that time, and Queen was probably one of the first bands that people started recognizing the, you know, aside from the Beatles who are, Mm -hmm. you know, Elvis, there's like phenomenons, um, would recognize in person because in the the early to mid seventies, bands could still kind of be anonymous. Right. Right. Um, you know, you'd look at the little picture on the record, but mm-hmm. you're not seeing them on TV all the time. You know, and, and the Beatles had done a very smart thing, too, with those two movies that they did with Hard Day's Night yep. and Help. That was an incredible different format for a musical situation. I mean, Elvis Presley had done all of his yeah. m- his movies, but um, when the Beatles went on to do that as well, I, you know, it was I think it was just going to only be a matter of time before the, the visual stuff was going to be out there. Yeah, it had you know, to. It had just to made evolve. sense. Yeah, that's for sure. So we did this tour it was fantastic had a lot of fun um and also for us after we broke away after we did the first leg of the tour and we broke away we were doing things like opening up with aerosmith and and there's i remember um opening for maria Maldor, doing michael urbaniak we did a saratoga springs um festival at one point wow and there was uh we opened for steppenwolf um, Edgar Winter in White Trash. It was, it was amazing. It, the band lasted for about four or five years. Which is a pretty long life for a band at that time. And that- it was, it was, it was amazing that it lasted that long. <laughs> yeah. Between, you know, I mean, the, the order of the day, as we all know, is, you know, the drugs and alcohol and rock yeah. and roll and party. And, <laughs> Uh, you know, I used to take pride in the fact that I was always the straightest one in the band because I didn't have a car at the time. <laughs> I was on the road, so why have a car? But I wanted to make sure I got home alive. Yeah. You know, so I was always uh, kept kept my wits about me. and um, Unusual for the time for most people. Unusual for the times. And, um, and the band fell apart. I mean, between there was, there was management change. There was a lot of changes going on within CBS at the time as well. And um, one thing led to another. And um, we were in the studio, in the CBS studios this time. For the set to record the second album and it got recorded it never got completed i have a copy of it and there's some some really nice stuff on there any of your songs on there no 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 and um and the band fell apart the band just fell apart um there was too many there was casualties that and were you like, that's it? I was in a band for years. It was great, but and I just for on. myself, I just you know, I needed I needed the rest. I bet because it had been such a whirlwind of things, and I needed to step back and regroup and rethink and and try and figure out, you know, am I, is this am I going to stay with this? Yeah. I mean, this was an opportunity handed to me. It was given to me, and I went with it. And I did the best I could, and I I felt I did a great job, but I didn't really know if that's where I was going to stay. And I I still to this day say God had His hands on my shoulders, saying steering me in that direction yeah. i started to get involved with some local bands to try and see if you know that's what i was going to stay with having been able to make money make a living it was certainly a fun way to make a living oh yeah you know it was hard it's a lot harder than people expect yeah but at the same time it was certainly a fun way to do it and um so i spent some time with, with local bands there was a, a few years there where i spent time with the local bands trying to get more chops in a different way i wanted to learn to, be, learn to become a lead singer that i accomplished to do and um I wound up becoming romantically involved with one of my best friends during that period of time uh, with Roy Bennett. And he had been getting involved with the business in the end of the technical part of things. He had always wanted to be a lighting designer, stage designer, lighting director. And uh, he was working as a grunt with uh, a local lighting company called Pollock Lighting. And, and their first big account they got was when was brought Boston's first tour. Oh, wow, which had a lot of lights. First, <laughs> first, first tour, <laughs> yeah. first album, that mega, mega, mega hit album. Still thinks like the, the third most highest selling album of all time or something. Yes, Still. it's amazing. He was on the road with them and he learned everything he needed to learn from that. And Roy is a fantastic kind of guy where you just... You can't help but like him. You yeah. can't help but be attracted to him. He made a lot of friends. One of the friends that he made uh, was the people who owned and ran a company called Zenith Lighting. They were from out of England, and they had a, a satellite office in Los Angeles. And he was in the right place at the right time. He was in he was in Los Angeles, and he happened to be in the offices when this man by the name of Stephen Finoli from Newport, Rhode Island, <laughs> walked in looking for a situation where he had an artist, he was managing an artist that needed to have, um, needed to go on tour to promote the current album. 
This was in 1980, but it was a very low budget situation. And did mm-hmm. they know anybody? Did they have anybody in there? Up camp? and coming that was scrappy that was and good. Up dude. and coming that was willing to do, yeah, that was willing to do uh, work for this artist, but at a, a low budget kind of situation. And the person that, at the time said, "Well, as a matter of fact," he introduced him to Roy. He said, "This guy is great. He's got a great, good head on his shoulders. He's got some great ideas. Why don't you talk with him?" And it was for Prince. (laughs) And um, one of the things about Prince was that if he liked you, he had to meet you. Mm -hmm. And if he liked you, regardless of what your credentials may have been at the time, then you were in. So Steve gave uh, a bunch of Prince's music to Roy to listen to. And um, Roy's way to work is not to sit, not to listen to music and then sit behind like a drafting table and start coming up with ideas in different ways. Roy has this actual, it's an actual condition. Don't ask me the name of it. You can look it up somewhere, but there's an actual name for it where Roy sees music in color. Synesthesia. Synesthesia? Synesthesia. You know this word. Yes. Oh my goodness. Synesthesia is fascinating. And and Roy has this. Yeah. So he sees colors when he hears music. Exactly. Certain letters are always the same color. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, synesthesia yes. is fascinating and perfect for someone doing lighting. Yes. And for all I knew at the time, that was maybe that's the reason why he wanted to do this, because he had this. And he was so attuned to music. I mean, we became married, and I'm, there was one room in our house that was just wall-to-wall albums of so much different things. He was started working for Prince, and it was for the Dirty Mind Tour, and he asked me to come down to New York. They was going to be doing a show at, at um, the Palace, I think it was. No, the Ritz. Mm-hmm. It was the Ritz. And asked me to come down. He wanted for me to meet, meet Prince. Plus, he wanted for me to, to be there and, and hang out together. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. And I came down. And I went to New York and um, met Prince within hours of hearing that John Lennon was shot the night before. Wow. In New York. In New York. I was there. And I, I nearly lost it. Yeah. You know, John was of all the, of the four Beatles. He was, he was my, he was my guy. Yeah. You know, and, um, and that was a huge pop culture blow for everybody because they were, it was, it was when we started to see that the, the, the musicians you grew up with were human people who are superhuman the, the human factor yes yes because yeah. elvis was 77 which was probably kind of jarring for a lot of people too but the the sort of excess of elvis made it a little more palatable there was that glamour that shaded yeah. over that kind of kind of glowed over everybody and... but john lennon will probably seemed immortal right so it was i imagine just a huge blow it, it was an incredible blow and here i was going off to meet this person and i was so bummed yeah and so upset and i just kept saying to myself hold it together hold it together hold it together you know i just i didn't want to be meeting this person and be in tears it, and seem like it, it wasn't important to me or to him that it was important to me to meet him yeah you know and i was doing everything i could at that time to put keep hold it together and it was just, a, it, Ken, it was such an odd thing for me at the time here. It was the death of a hero of me at the same time that I was meeting this person who was going to be huge, Could incredibly you tell? huge. Could you tell, though, that, they, I mean, did your husband, like, this guy, he, Roy, That huge. was one of the things Roy had said to me. He says, you've got to meet this guy. There's just something about him. I think he's going to be huge. I really think he's going to be something big and uh, and different and um when I met him, it was in his dressing room. It was upstairs in backstage in one of the dressing rooms. And the, <laughs> sorry, Prince, I had to say this, but, you know, my first Im- impression or my first thought when I saw him physically was, Oh, he's, he's the same height as I am. Yeah. Or, you know, like he's not he's taller like than Bowen. me, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. and he was so adorable. I mean, his eyes were just, just looked right into me, you know, and, and I, and I was mesmerized, you know, and he shook my hand. And he said, hi, nice to meet you. And I said, hi and everything. And I just, was totally in the moment, thank God. And um, then when I heard his music that night and watched him on stage, you know, um, I just said, this is he definitely, he's definitely got something, you know? And, yeah. And I thought that, um, you know, this this really could go big. This could go really and far. And nobody was doing, especially what he was doing at that time, mm-hmm. which was the first rec- couple of records are great, mm-hmm. and they're, but they're still very rooted in the in the soul music of that time right and this record was there's some crazy heavy guitar stuff on there and there's very new wavy stuff and Mm -hmm. then in uh, in addition to especially dirty minds i mean the (laughs) the subject matter on that record (laughs) is completely uh, it's it's maybe his weirdest lyrical stuff on that record i know but you know you gotta look Uh, you can look at a million of your tv guides and look at, at how sex sells yeah 
Absolutely. And, Especially at know, that point. And, and you have to, at some point in time, you know, so they're going to, you're going to, whether it's yourself or it's another artist, they're going to do, they've got to do something to, to get attention. I always liken Lady Gaga to that. Mm -hmm. You know, she's got a fantastic voice. And she, but she could have been totally lost in amongst all the other thousands of people that have a fantastic voice. Yeah. Um, you know, and another one is perfect example of, um, Madonna. You know, she had the, the whole package, you know, and she used sex to sell it too, you know. And luckily at this time now had a venue to sell mm -hmm. whatever you want, but really sex, especially because MTV started in 82. Right. And you had a lot of local shows as well. Um, we had V66 here in the Boston area briefly, which was our sort of rival, but American Bandstand, uh, was having these acts on and started having mm -hmm. less of the clean cut acts on. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. Soul Train was playing in markets that were, yeah. you know, traditionally not getting black music, but, you know, white kids are watching the show. Right. And what was the other show too that used to, be? something gold? Oh, Solid Gold. Solid Gold. Yes, Solid Gold. Band yep. Six, we, we did that show twice. We did Soul Train two or three times. Um, I remember that. <laughs> I think that's the you first time I heard you say it from Boston. Too. Yeah, when um, mm -hmm. um, I think uh, Don Cornelius is, is thinking you're all from Minneapolis or something, and you're like, right. I'm from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> and I had been very much in within the Boston area a lot at the time too. And uh, but anyway, so that's kind of how it happened. So you started with working with him. Didn't you start doing like some um, visual design stuff? Well, I, I um, Roy wanted me to come out on tour with him. Mm -hmm. You know, it was not the not the Dirty Mind tour. But uh, the next tour, the mm -hmm. controversy tour, I wasn't doing anything musically at the time. I was just local, uh, doing a local job, you know, making my way in that in that respect. And I had kind of gotten disgusted with the scene. Mm -hmm. You know, I, yeah. I really, I was spoiled right off yeah. the bat. Having it's hard been to go back. In a band where no, not only did we do covers, but we did original music as well. And yeah. I liked the old, the, I was so behind the whole original music thing that I really wanted to sit and regroup and think that you know i i if i'm going to continue in music that's what i really want to do yeah, you're touring with queen it's hard to go play a wedding <laughs> you know immediately after it's 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 totally you know you're like it's tough <laughs> how do you do it yeah how can you do it so i um wasn't doing anything musically i'd put it aside and just thought yeah you know I, i'm disgusted with this and uh went on the road with with uh with roy uh in the prince tour and but at the same time i um uh, I'm not the girly kind of woman that likes to go shopping every right. day. Grew up with two brothers. You in know, New I grew up with two brothers, <laughs> and I had no choice but to be a tomboy a lot at the time because where I grew up, there wasn't a lot of other girls around to be girlfriends with. So I kind of like was either by myself or you know playing cowboys and Indians or right. something. You know? I felt I needed to earn my way. Right. I needed to earn my spot on the tour bus. I needed to earn that bunk and um, to earn the respect of the crew that I was around. I needed to do something and, and I needed to do something. I couldn't just do nothing. I yeah. couldn't bring my artwork with me and do that every day. Yeah. You know, I I'm just, just going to read. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> I just, uh, so I talked to Roy about it. And before we knew it, I wound up with four jobs on the tour. <laughs> I had two jobs on the crew and I had two jobs for Prince. Um, I was taking care of his wardrobe uh -huh. and I was filming him every night. Um, I was d doing video uh, footage of, of the show um, for, for critiquing purposes and stuff to see what worked and what didn't work. You so know? he's watching like highlight reels to and, and yeah. improve stuff. Yeah, he's he's always, I mean, because he's always working, you know, somebody of that caliber has got to be doing that. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to be checking things and, and he was always creating. He was always writing as he goes and, and, and trying different things to see what would work and see what, you had to keep things fresh. I would film his, his show every night and we'd, he'd take a look at it and sometimes we did it together and I was able to do become involved with uh, with things too where he he liked what I did in that respect to the point that there were a couple of times on on his tour that a company a video company came in to film something for one reason or another and he had them work with me because I knew the show <laughs> yeah, too I I'm knew the show. to direct you I knew where he was going to be at certain times of the stage stage left or right or forward backwards whatever the case may be and and okay you've got to do this here and that was great yeah. I loved that. I loved all of that. Did he know you were a musician at all? Not at the so time. So he just was, okay. Not at the time. And I never had that kind of conversation with him. Right. I didn't have that kind of relationship with him to be able to um, just sit down and say, hey, yeah. by the way, I'm singing. You know, I sing a little. I yeah. This. It was very businessy. It like, was very professional, yeah, yeah. but still it was a, a different, yeah, it was business that is, you know. Until we had had a break. 
It was around Christmas that we'd had a break. Everybody dispersed and gone off in their own directions. When we got back together, we all met in some place in the Midwest. Okay. And I have to look back at old, yeah. you know, like tour things, tour um, itineraries and to try and figure out which place it was. But again, it was another school. And they had given the, the, the some of the locker rooms over to dressing rooms. And um, I was in his dressing room and I'd been setting everything up and... He had a table where he had all of, um, like, hair product things and, you know, makeup things and jewelry things and that sort of accoutrement. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he had a little boom box that was on the table. I was working in there, and he came and sat down. And I noticed that he was there, and he started working on some stuff, his hair or whatnot, and he popped a cassette tape into the boom box. And it was Stevie Nicks. It was in, she was in the process of writing Stand Back. And so it was, it wasn't a final edited version. It was still a work tape. It was a work song. And she was working with him a bit, had been in contact with him, wanting to possibly do something to cook, to, to collaborate on right. something together. So he was listening to this, um, this tape. And, you know, when you've been around music all your life and you've been singing for such a long time, you, it doesn't take you long to pick up on stuff. And so I start singing along. And I'm not even paying attention to what I'm doing. Yeah. And that, and you know, in that respect, I'm I'm doing my little bits that I'm doing around the. You're whistling while you work. I'm basically. whistling. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You can say it like that. And um, I turn around, and Prince is looking at me in the mirror, and he's got his hand up in the air with a curling iron, and he's just, <laughs> you know, looking, looking. You know. And I said, "What?" Because <laughs> you have a a very big voice. You have I, a really powerful voice. I do. How do I do that? <laughs> Where does it come from? I don't understand. I imagine it would be extra surprising because, uh, you know, you're, you're someone he doesn't think is a musician that he doesn't know is a musician. Right. And it's this kind of big, soulful voice coming out. And I'm this like short, little blonde hair, blue eyed kind of you know, <laughs> yeah. sort of almost girl next door looking kind of person that just, you know, had my jeans on and whatnot. Right. And um, he turned around and he looked at me and he said, You could be the other hooker. <laughs> and I, Thank you. What? <laughs> I said, what are you talking about? So we talked and he was talking about this, this three girl act kind of thing that, um, he was working with. And, um, they had three, there was three girls, but one of them was leaning towards not being a part of it. He was helping out by trying to put this thing to, uh, you know, get it started and get it going and whatnot. And, um, so he asked if I'd be interested. And I remember him calling Chick in, his big bodyguard yeah. at the time saying, what do you think? And I remember him turning around, look at me, and, and going, "Well, she's certainly pretty enough." <laughs> <laughs> High compliment, uh, you know. Yeah. And I went, "Oh, you know, <laughs> thanks." And because obviously, you know, they hadn't heard me sing or anything at the time. So he and he still hadn't heard me sing until I set foot in his studio in his house in Chanhassen, Minnesota, to sing on "Nasty Girls." That was the first thing that. That you was sang? the first time. That was the first time he ever heard me sing. Wow. He didn't even ask me to sing along with anything or pick up a guitar and say, "Here, you know, let's jam." Yeah, yeah. Nothing. Nothing. He was just like, "I'm pretty sure you can." Do I this. finished the tour, and um, there was somewhere along the way that this this beautiful dark haired, dark eyed woman shows up on the road, and she's with him, and I'm, I was introduced to her. Her name was Denise Matthews, and um, she was so very obviously with him, and she was gorgeous. I found out later, as time was going on towards the end of the tour, that this is one of the girls that I was going to be working with. So you're in the band with, yeah. You know, and I thought, oh my God, <laughs> you know. So we all, the, the tour finished, we all went home and did our little bits at home off the road for a little bit, and I had, I think I had like two weeks, and I had to be back in Chanhassen. Yeah. To fly back into Chanhassen. To just, you're going to record this record and... And we're going to start recording. Yeah. And he wanted to do it with us in his house, and... um I walked in and they'd already been working on Nasty Girl. And, um, I, I, as soon as I heard it, I went, Oh no. <laughs> it's mean, a hard it, sell, I imagine. It sounded yeah. great, you yeah. know, and here I was in his studio and here I was with, you know, I'm gonna, he's actually gonna be here doing this with us. And like, you know, oh my God. And I had met Susan, loved Susan right off the bat. She and I just got a lot, just hit it off. She was in Minnesota for her education. I, my, my whole thing was, Oh my God, gonna be singing this stuff. Yeah. Am Not I the can, kind of stuff you were used am to singing. I, no, you know, and then like, oh no, what is my father going to say? <laughs> this is as what far... What is my, my mother going to say? It's as far know? from traditional country music you as know? one can get. Oh, jeez. 
over time, I, I, I kind of like just went with it and bucked up and, you know, saw the sense in it or saw, you know, where this could lead. Saw, right. you know, not only where it could lead for me, you know, being able to be back into an original situation in music and, right. you know, what kind of, um, what other avenues it, it, it would open up for me to walk down, you know? And it probably helped that you had been touring with him for a while and you kind of got that thing. Mm -hmm. A little bit like you were able to look at Dirty Mind and not be totally horrified and be like, I am not working on this. That Like, kind of get <laughs> what the whole thing was about. Right. Imagine if someone had just presented that song to you cold, you would have been like, nope. No way. <laughs> I, yeah. I would have really been hesitant, for yeah. sure. Because I really didn't expect that that's what was going to happen. And, right. But then I didn't really know all the rest of the details till I got there. So I was kind of like, all right, in for a penny, in for a pound, let's yeah. do it! Which is a reoccurring theme here. You're just like, <laughs> if we're going to do it, sure, why not? Yeah. So you record yeah. just that song, or did you do the whole record? Yeah, we did. I did the whole record. Okay. I did the whole record. That week. And um, started doing some writing, you know, and over the next seven years, I was with him for seven years. in his Within, within his umbrella and organization for seven years. And that was kind of the, um, people could argue differently, but I think that was the golden age of the stuff that Prince was doing just for volume and the... 1999 and Purple yeah. Rain were peaking. Yeah, yeah, 99, Purple Rain, and then into that, just that, that's the revolution. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the Prince most people know. Right. And that was easily if not the biggest tour of the year that year was in the top three with like born in the usa and maybe the thriller tour right, <laughs> they, those right. were the tours you're right that everyone was going to sure and uh you know you you had been this experience with the other band before which was was sizable compared to where you came from but i imagine this is totally different universe this was international you know with ken Lyon and the tombstone band the experience i had started out in the business with that was national and mm -hmm. that was big enough i mean it, uh, this 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 little girl coming from this new england town that never done anything in music before and here she is on stage you know opening up for people that, i mean we never were a, a headliner act right. in some of these places i mean back in our own turf back in our own you know hometowns and um local new england area and stuff we were big and um so we were headlining there but when we got out um you know in the national circuit we we're we we're still opening we still hadn't gotten to the, to the point where we were national but still it was it was big i mean i had hit the big time you know if you wanted to say it i, I had hit the big time in that in in that period of time i i was familiar yeah but also it was here was here I had been in a position where I I want to be in an original situation. You know, my father was great for sayings. This I never knew a person that ever had the kind of sayings like my father did. And one of the things he used to say to me when I was growing up was, "Be careful what you say and ask the universe of." Right. <laughs> because it's listening you at just all might get times, it. <laughs> and you just might get it. I guess that's you know I I I sometimes feel like it's six of one, half dozen of the other, that it was something that I was attracted to and thought, geez, what up? What if? And whereas the, on the other side, of that of that other side of that coin, God had his hands on me and said, oh, you're going, to, you're going. Yeah, I'm happen. putting you here and, and you better do the best, you know. I've given you a voice and that's, you know, all of this stuff aside, Ken, that's what it comes down to. I was gifted and blessed with a voice. Yeah. As singing, speaking, I, people still, you know, they look at me, and as soon as I open my mouth, they kind of go, "Whoa, yeah, wait a minute, this doesn't <laughs> this doesn't match." Right, this is not what I expected. Right, yeah, which kind of instantly gives you an advantage. I mean, if you're able to surprise Prince mm -hmm. or put, you know, uh, someone like that who's used to probably being the person mm -hmm. who surprises people, right. or kind of puts people uh, off kilter a little bit, mm -hmm. if you're able to do that to them, you you open doors with those kind of people or sort of earn a certain kind of respect. I think I like my voice. Um, not for its individual essence to it, but I'm comfortable with it. I enjoy it. Um, I think there's a spiciness to it that um, is comforting to me. And uh, another thing my dad used to say, if you don't use it, God gives you a talent, you don't use it, he'll take it away. And um, so I've been using it. I've shared the blessing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that <laughs> different that, times. That record was huge. It was, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the tour started before purple ring came out i think it was the time vanity six and prince doing this tour i think it locally i think you played the worcester centrum or something or maybe providence arena or something like with vanity six we didn't do all of the tour with them did you play did you play in providence like did did people you grew up with or your family see you in that we did the civic center did they come to the show yeah what did they think well my parents were living in arizona at the time okay so it was they had to wait my father had passed away unfortunately sorry um by the time that i was involved with this 
And, um, but my mom came to the show. She came to two, uh, to Phoenix when we played in Phoenix. Were you nervous about that? Um, well, you know, with my mom, no, because by that time I had been pretty saturated into it. Right. You know, and also, you know, she didn't particularly approve of the sexual connotation right. of it all and having to wear lingerie performing <laughs> a on little, stage. Yeah, that's, a, you know, that's the other Brenda, piece we haven't on. mentioned. Yeah, <laughs> you know? not only that's the content, but it's also but, <laughs> like, here's your stage outfit. <laughs> yes. Okay. And uh, if you look at some of the pictures, you'll notice that I was always the one who had the least... It, I tried to wear something that was more like closer to swimwear. Yeah, you're the most demure. You know, kind of the, like, yeah. There was a couple of photo sessions we did where I went, "All right, fine, give me the trashy lingerie." <laughs> yeah, and um, and I went for you know the whole nine yards, but um, I hated it. I yeah, hated it. I, I you know it's it's just for me sexuality has its place. It must have been hard to concentrate playing though too. Like I just think of when I was in a band and if I was like had a coat on and I was too hot it would be like distracting I can't imagine if I'm like you know and, it's, and, and also it, well <laughs> when I think back when I'm sitting here listening to you and I'm thinking I'm going it's kind of contradictory when you know I was a hippie in my high school days you know in the 70s and I swam naked in the pond at the Woodstock <laughs> Festival yeah you know, that's not but on here the stage at the Central. On stage, you know, <laughs> and you know, when I think of being at, Ju at Joe Louis Arena performing in front of forty thousand people in yeah. my underwear, that's a different story. That's literally a nightmare people have. Mm. I'm in front of forty thousand people in my underwear. <laughs> that's literally a classic <laughs> nightmare that people have, and that's what you're doing for a living. <laughs> the only thing would be with like we're doing an album Brenda where it's a test you didn't study for. That would be the <laughs> only way that could be more of like a classic scenario. And that's it, what you what. You you just mentioned about it that's what it was for me going in to record vanity six you know it was just, it was a test you know for me especially too because i had no idea what i was walking into <laughs> i didn't know i had no idea what the material is going to be and you know i enjoyed it you know i bottom line is i enjoyed it and um it was work it sounds like I mean, it you was were... incredible amount of work i i wound up in hospital four times from exhaustion because you were I mean, there's like the, the prince show is so much there's dancing and it's like choreographed and it's a huge stage show it's not just the bar the singing and it's not just the show yeah i mean that's the culmination of it you know when you but it's all the prep behind it. It's all yeah. the work that you got to do to put into that, to make that show happen. And travel. And to make them to sell those records, the promotional tours. Prince wasn't doing promotional tours yeah. at the time. He was, he the, the mystery stuff had really started to amp up as he got more prominent with mainstream mm -hmm. pop culture, it seemed like. Well, also, he had had a bad experience when he was first coming in, uh, yeah. up in the ranks um, of being misquoted, yeah. you know, and being um, totally... And, and I experienced this myself. There was a couple of times when we were on the on tour and we were in Canada. And when they found out that I was there, I was, I happened, I wasn't with, with the girls group at the time. I was, I was on the road with Prince and Roy, who was doing his lights. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was there with Roy and, and hanging out and doing some stuff with Prince. And they, um, some of the local media caught wind that I was there and wanted to do some interviewing. Mm -hmm. So I, I agreed to do it. And I remember this one particular newspaper I was doing uh, an interview with. When I got the paper, when I got the interview in print, my actual quotes were exactly what I said. But everything else that was written around those quotes took my quotes out of context of what we were talking about yeah. at the time of the interview. And so it was just, it was infuriating. They had gone in with an agenda of the story they were going to tell before they even interviewed you, likely. Pretty much. And th that happened a number of times with Prince to the point where, you know, it, it, it can kill you. Yeah. It can oh, break absolutely. your, it can break your career before it even has really that much of a chance to get, to get any further than where you are. And, um, having experienced that, you, you had to, I had to learn, um, uh, to be very, cautious oh i'm sure and it's in and, and you kind of have to be on all the time mm -hmm. which i think for you know in the comedy world i'm a little bit more used to that because people tend to to just kind of be like that but for musicians i've discovered a lot of them tend to be fairly shy or mm -hmm. introverted or you know they get it out on stage they're artists yeah they're not the kind of people who are like life of the party interview me all the time some are some are, but yeah. so it's it's you're you're making them do this skill set that they don't naturally inherently have it's and a lot politics. of it yeah. it's learning the politics of it yeah and that's tough and it's and it's it's a real game and it's a really uh it's a real knack that you have to learn and you You've got to learn it if that's where, if you're, you're going to put yourself in that position, you know. And the other thing that if you're going to put yourself in that position is to learn to let go of your privacy. Right. And in certain areas, you have to let go of it. You know, it's, and at the same time, you've got to learn how 
to keep your privacy. Right. And keep that hidden and keep it private. It's a real juggle. You have like a public you and then, it, you know, it's something most people don't have to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I imagine and now you're, you're getting recognized more because you're, the vanity stuff's on TV mm-hmm. and there's a video for Nasty Girl. And like you said, you're on Soul Train, you're on Solid Gold, you're on all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, was that, that had to be a whole new level where with the previous band, you weren't doing that sort of stuff. No, you? no, we weren't. We, so there was yeah. no, there was nothing within the film genre in any yeah. way that was happening. Had, like originally. Midnight Special was on at the time or right. like Don Kirshner's rock concert but oh, even God, that I'm, stuff oh, that yeah. was so great I you used know, to think Foreigner that was so fantastic that finally there was an outlet for modern music or pop music or you know right. rock and roll that was going to be able to and not just the American Bandstand it wasn't mm-hmm. just like what the teens are listening to they would right. show you know some more interesting stuff did you guys ever do American Bandstand? No, no so that would have been a really weird uh, that would have been weird something to watch. oh my god yeah. <laughs> yeah you know to have been able to work with Ricky Nelson on our last Apollonia 6 project yeah. with the Mr. Christian video um, that was, that took me totally by surprise. I had no idea that he'd been hired, that he'd auditioned and had been hired to do the, the to play the part. So he just auditioned. He had, it, that's, yeah. <laughs> um, we, you know, for some of the other people, um, the other guy from uh, Saturday Night Live, um, Buck Henry, Buck Henry and, and, uh, Ricky Nelson, they, they were people who, um, were contacted to audition for it. The other people that any about anybody else that was involved, um, we were given these g- given these big thick books of you know character actors right. to to look through and say, okay, pick a face, you yeah, know, pick this person. It didn't matter what they'd done, you know, because what they were going to do in this video, it, you know, wasn't anything that was going to be you know worth an Oscar performance. Right. But what was it like when you met Ricky? Well, Nelson? I got on up? the set the first day, and um, still the day before, even the night before. I'm asking questions. So who's going to be playing Mr. Christian? Do we know yet? Do we know yet? And we're being told by the management, well, you know, we got a couple ideas. We're not quite sure, you know, and somebody will be there. Don't yeah, worry about we'll it. We'll have you know? a Mr. Christian. You know, you just get in there and get, get started, get into makeup and everything. And, um, so I'd gotten there. I'd done, you know, I'd been through makeup and I'd been through hair and I was, hadn't done wardrobe or anything yet for the first segment. The management came in and I said, okay, so who's playing Mr. Christian because he was scared. He was on the schedule mm-hmm. to be, you know, on the, in the studio that day. And he says, Ricky Nelson. <laughs> and I didn't think it was the yeah, Ricky Nelson. Some odd, young, up and coming yeah. actor named Ricky Nelson. Yeah. Exactly. And, um, so I said, all right, well, where is he? He's in his dressing room getting, you know, getting ready to do makeup. And I thought, all right. So I wanted to go and say hello introduce myself you know we're going to be working with this person and when i walked into i just walked into his dressing room and you know when i saw who it was i was speechless (laughs) he turned around and looked at me and and gave me a big beautiful smile of his and said hi and i and i finally said hi this ricky (laughs) now You know, I, I was, I walked over and I shook his hand and I just, I was laughing. And I, I guess I get, you know, I, that's what I do when I get nervous. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, he probably I gets that a lot, kind of, I would imagine. I did it with Paul yeah. McCartney. I giggled and, you know, here we are. And I was thrilled to death. Oh my yeah. God, I was thrilled to death. And I said, I, you, I can't believe it's that you're working on this, but I'm working with you on this project. And he was very cool about it. He was yeah. very down to earth. And I said, I used to watch you all the time when I was growing up. I used to tune your parents' program in just to see you and hope that you were going to play. Play. I didn't care so much about the acting part, but I, you know, that he was playing as little Ricky. I just was hoping that every time they had the show that he, you were going to be doing a song at the end of the show. This part wasn't that big yeah. in this project. He's kind of at the beginning and the end. Mm. His voice, you hear his voice in the beginning, like yeah. the reading of the Wilkes kind of thing. And then you see him at the end coming on in after I do my Your song, song right? Blue yeah. Limousine. Yep. He comes in, here comes a blue limousine and the windows were all blacked out in the limousine and the window comes down and this rose comes out the window and we're all standing. We look in and it's Mr. Christian. He hasn't died after all. And uh, it's him. We all get into the limo with him, but it was fun. And you had already been around for like when Purple Rain was filming. Lots of- it was after. It was after Purple Rain. It was, um, it was starting to be the wind down uh, at, at that period. Um, there was a lot of change in the air. Yeah. At that time, Prince, with the, with the success with the onset of the success of Purple Rain movie and how well it did. Because it's not just music now. Mm, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Prince, um, That's that was a, a medium that he wanted to dabble in a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And so, of course, he went on to do Under the Cherry Moon from yep. there and Graffiti Bridge. Um, 
they didn't do anywhere near as what the impact of the Purple Rain was, but um, they still they did well. There were changes. The family came into existence. Mm-hmm. The band, the family, was Susanna Melvoin. Yep. They had the Scrims of Passion, I think, was the single that they put out. Mm. Mm-hmm. Sheila E. had been, well, she was with us on Purple Rain tour. Sheila Playing e. drums, e. right? Yeah. Um, Timbales. She, oh, I love her. She she's amazing. so much fun. Yeah. And such a such an artist. I mean, such a well, musician. She's got that pedigree. I mean, her dad. Oh. And, yeah. I mean, she's got chops. Like, she's, she's got chops. I mean, she's all drummer. reflex. The girl is reflex. I mean, there's no, she doesn't break a sweat, you know, and, and she's just so much fun to be with. And we had a great time together. And it sounds like, you know, <laughs> and Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis are going through the stratosphere with all the stuff they're producing and writing. They're starting all to time, do their working producing. Working with Janet Jackson. Yeah. And, and there's so a little story with that stuff's one all, there, yeah. yeah. Stuff's all kind of getting bigger, but also further apart, I imagine. Because people further kind of apart. Yeah. Well, thing. people are being, they're spreading their wings. Everybody had gotten to the point where they were able to do that. Yeah. You know, they're able to, find other avenues you know, that, that were open for for everybody to experiment and, and things like that um vanity i mean with uh, apollonia excuse me she had already been within the filming industry mm-hmm. uh, when she became a part of uh, apollonia 6 and did purple rain and she wanted to get more immersed into that she wasn't yeah. so much a music person she did what she could what she did with it and had had a good time with it but she wanted to get back w- into more filming yeah use it as more of a bit of a springboard to get a higher profile right. actor and she had done like Miami Vice and was in you mm-hmm. know a bunch of large shows at that time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and vanity went off to do a ton of acting but she started as an actress before the band i think she was she started as an actress as well Island yeah and she was a model but even Morris Day started acting and stuff mm-hmm. and a lot of those guys did you ever want to do after filming this stuff where you're like oh maybe I want to oh, do you bet. the camera yeah. you bet and and not so much with being in front of the camera I enjoyed that but um, I would like to be in behind the camera because you had had that experience kind of directing these shoots and things yeah, yeah. and and just uh, the writing part of, of ideas and things I have I have a couple of ideas now that I would love to sit down with Ridley Scott or Peter Jackson and say I got this idea, guys. Do you watch a lot of historical stuff, or, or are you just drawn to it? I have always been drawn to it. Yeah. Historical things. Uh, growing up, my mother would take me to, to see the films like Ben Hur. Okay. And Camelot. So you like epics. And I love epics, yeah. And, yeah. and, and all this stuff. And, um, and, um, and I'm just a history person anyway. I, I naturally gravitate towards it. And, um, another thing that he was instrumental in is, um, he was, he, he became very active in the lace industry. My father was a lace weaver. And, Very um, appropriate for the for the prince uh, there uh, connection. You go. I know. Well, all this stuff started happening. I was. See, I wonder if my dad made that. Yeah. You know, I joke about it, but it is such a weird parallel of you know from Ricky Nelson to Ricky Nelson, and then like <laughs> to lace to lace. You know, it's like a very <laughs> weird know. bookend of how this stuff reoccurred <laughs> in your life. I turn around and I look back down the road, Ken. You know, and I just still shake my head and wonder, going. Did I really do this? Yeah, it doesn't feel like it happened. You know, like, um, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, I was inducted into the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame last April. Ed was there. And that's in that new, that old, uh, building that is the new, is it Lupo's is right next to it? Don't they have all the... The Met. Yeah, the Met. The Met. I did a stand-up show there last year. It's the artist village. Walk the hall, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Really cool building. It's a very cool building. And there's, yeah, there's that hallway. And I now have my... Um, a little window there. With yeah, the, that's my, really cool. It was my life. I lived yeah. it, and so much a part of it were things that were I was blessed to receive, and not things that I I worked while yeah. I was in it. I certainly totally worked um, very very hard in in while I was in it. But it, I I don't know. I can't put my finger on any one particular sentence that can say that can sum it up. Do you ever revisit any of that stuff? Do you ever rewatch it, or um, you know, you're flipping through the channels and it, you know, purple rains on all the time. Is it Once weird? To be, you just yeah. like what? You just kind of sit there and are like, oh, I was there for this. Well, I I I find myself looking at it technically. I'll say, oh, I remember what happened there. I remember, yeah, I remember having to get up at three thirty, yeah. four o'clock in the morning, and there was three inches of ice on the outside of my on my window. Of Take my hotel forty, room. Yeah, you know, yeah. like yeah, stuff like this, and how freezing it was during a scene because we were in this. It was in the winter time, and we were in this warehouse <laughs> that didn't have. They had this huge like jet blow heat blowers, yeah. you know, and while you were filming, you couldn't have them on, so you were freezing. I remember Susan getting so sick with the flu because we were <laughs> well, she's wearing this, underwear. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect outfit for that kind of uh, rehearsal. 12 then, degree weather. You and know. you also went, you were saying earlier, like you were going to like the AMAs and all the award shows and like yeah. you sat next to Paul Rubens at one of these things, yeah. which, you know. I, and I sat next to Sean Lennon, one of them too. Oh, did you, did you speak to him? Yes, I did. 
Wow. Yes, I did. You know, and to, and, and like how things come around, like yeah. you're saying, you know, I mean, just, um, that was, that was the beginning for me was with the Beatles and how after having been able to get involved in certain areas of the music business and it was something that was always in the back of my mind. I do have to admit is, is to wonder if I was ever going to be able to, um, have contact in some way with one of the, with, with the one of them. Or yeah. How they were going to be able to enter into my life somehow. And, you know, having met Prince, on the night af- on the day after Lennon was shot and being right there in New York at the time yeah. when it happened it just and funny enough too the very first show that uh, that Vanity 6 did was at the same place as Prince was at that night really the Ritz just by happenstance kind yeah. of just I don't know why or how it was set up that way but that was the very first show that we did before we did a series of some shows mm-hmm. on stage before we, we went on tour with with uh, Time and, and Prince um, and that was the very first live gig that we did as, as Vanity Six was at the Ritz. Man, were you seeing all these people? Were, you know, like Jesse Johnson had his own solo career and all these people. Des Dickerson were doing solo, went out yeah. his. Were you seeing that after the, the world sort of changing from this kind of small band of people that you mm-hmm. had been associated with for years and then, you know, late 80s, early 90s? It's. That's it was everything. it was amazing to have been able to be a part of it and to witness the growth. And that's what happens is it, it it did grow. It grew. I mean, not only did we grow as big as we did, but the offshoots and and what other people were mm-hmm. able to go on and continue doing. You know, with Jimmy Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis doing their production stuff. You know, Prince going off and doing reinventing himself in different areas. Yeah. You know? Um, Jesse Johnson and his stuff. Um, you know, the time quieted down and and. They wound up obviously getting back together again. Um, Morris Day going off and doing his acting bits. Yeah, you know? and, and the th- the fact of it is, is that they did it. You know, they could very well have just turned around, and gone back home to Minnesota. Me turn around, and go back home, and do whatever. I wound up going off to. I wanted to. You know, I could see the lay of the land with you know my situation. Yeah, you'd been around the block before and kind of saw how these things go. Right. Even though it wasn't a, a the same kind of a casualty situation, so to say, with with Tombstone, it still had its its fallen apart period of time. And um, Apollonia went off to do her acting. She she was on Falcon Crest. Mm-hmm. And Susan wanted to go back to school. She hadn't finished her education, and that's what she wanted to do. So she went back and and, to, and picked up where she left off with her education. And I was kind of s- sitting there going, "Okay, what do I do now? Mm-hmm. Now again, what do I do now? Right. <laughs> How many times has that happened to me in my life? And it's still happening, isn't <laughs> so it? You're um, in what, act, act nine of <laughs> yeah. the play or something? Yeah. <laughs> still breathing? Yeah. <laughs> it goes on. It goes, and the road goes on. I wanted to continue in music. Mm-hmm. You know, I had gotten to the point where I'd made a, a, a decent name for myself yeah. in the music business. And I wanted to do something. I never have had the ego that I needed to be out there feeding off the audience all the time. You know, my, my main thing for me with music is um, the creative aspect of yeah, it. You want to make music. <laughs> being in the studio. <laughs> yeah. That's where I'd rather be. I, I I look at it like cooking. You know, you have a recipe of something. You create it. You put together a, re- a recipe, and then you start from there, and you build and build and build, and you hope it's going to taste really good. But it sounds like you were very astute and learning from all the situations you'd been in, in that you were paying a little bit more attention than most people would to try and pick up some stuff that you could use later it sounds like so i imagine like if you're in the studio with prince hmm. who's one of the guys that gets how studios can do you're picking stuff up like about production well, thank that you maybe that's, other a, that's people a nice aren't. that's a good very good insight and i kind of feel like i've been a fo- i would have been a fool not to still never realizing or really knowing where my road was going to lead i stayed with i stayed in music and um, i was looking for somebody else i was looking for a partner to write with and Mm -hmm. to do it with to do a a project together with and i remember driving down sunset boulevard listening to it had the radio on and a song came on that really caught my ear don't ask me the name of it (laughs) i can't remember but it was it was the person singing the song the voice the sound of the voice caught my ear Mm -hmm. and i liked the song and it turned out to be john palumbo Mm -hmm. doing a solo uh he he had a solo album out at the time, and he's um one of the he was the main writer and one of the main focal front people for a band called Crack the Sky mm-hmm. from out of the Baltimore area, who had done pretty well. And I really liked the sound of his voice. Turns out that um, Jeff Sharp, who had been our tour manager, was from the Baltimore area, and he knew John. Yet another coincidence. Yeah, yep. yep. you know, I mean, things happen for a reason. Yeah, yeah. I guess you know, and so he put me in touch with him. Um, we started writing. 
and I really liked what we were doing, but there wasn't anything specifically solid enough yet at that particular time, right. you know, in the beginnings of whether I, that was that was going to be the path I was going to take. It's still the musical sort of courtship period where yeah. you're trying to yeah. do the little chess game of how this is going to fit together. And, and you know, at the risk of sounding um, whatever, I <laughs> didn't want to, I wanted to find me, you know, yeah. the stuff I did with... Apollonia 6, the stuff I did with, and, and with Vanity 6, it was all, st you know, I did really well with it. Prince really liked the job that I did. He really liked what I sounded like, but he also offered to do a solo project with me. Oh. Knowing that it wasn't really my, yeah. my music for if, me. That if was you had good, chosen the best it, vehicle yeah, for me. it wouldn't have been. So we started working on it. We did work on a couple of things, and one of the songs that, that we did together was 17 Days. Which is my favorite Prince song. Is it really? It's hands down my favorite Prince song. Oh my song. god, I yeah, love that song. I, I absolutely And we're love doing that song. that song, aren't we? <laughs> it's, yeah. it's such a great song, and was ended up being a B-side, mm -hmm. um, but is unbelievable. That's easily my favorite Prince song. Well, that was a song that was one of the first efforts for a solo project with yeah. me. And then when he got busy going off and doing this and doing that, and I mean, there was so much going on, and all of a sudden, you know, the the, the world really was the oyster yeah. at this point, that anything could happen, and anything was available to, to work towards. So he went off, and, and my solo project kind of got put on the shelf for a while mm -hmm. with him. And so I just thought, well, you know, I don't want to stop there, and I do want to continue doing something, and I... I uh, started do doing some writing with, with John Palumbo. We recorded 17 Days, and when you hear that recording, if you listen closely enough, my vocal's still there. And um, he's always given me that song to play with. Yeah. You know, he's uh, every time, when I, still now, if I see him, he'll say, you can play with, aren't you going to do anything with 17 Days? <laughs> do something with 17 Days. If you want to, do it, you know. Because this was around the time when he was really, there was a lot of artists getting sort of Prince, Manic Monday, mm -hmm. which I think was an Apollonia song. That was first. an Apollonia song. Yeah, I recorded on that. In fact, yeah. My vocal is still on that when you listen to the Bangles. Do yeah, it. that's on the Bangles one. And then yeah. um, Sinead O'Connor was doing Nothing Compares to You, which I think yep. is a family song originally, maybe yep. on the family it record. Was. Absolutely. Um, so it's it was and it was all within like a two year period. All of mm -hmm, these songs mm -hmm. by these other artists right. um, that were coming out. And I think he gave the song Kiss to the Van Maserati and they didn't want it. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'd heard. He gave the, but it's a weird song. Like I could, I could imagine a band getting but a tape of that. who wound up doing it? it, it um, Tom, Tom Jones. Jones. Yeah, right. Variety of all people, show fame. Yeah. You know? and doing it really well. <laughs> and too. doing it really yeah. well. That's so, the only Tom Jones can do. He's yeah. fabulous. And and you know, Mavis Staples had done the record with him this time, which actually some of your more soulful stuff always kind of reminds me of Mavis Staples. Oh, I'm I love a big Mavis fan Staples. of Staples. I was um, doing a couple of her numbers. Yeah, me. I love like what happened to the real me. one of my favorite songs of all time, and just yeah. some of that stuff. That time it would just would have seemed yeah like the world was the oyster was going right, on all right one of the people that had been um one of the uh directors with zenith lighting was an i name a guy by the name of simon austin he was really close friends with roy and i so he started uh, when i was doing this i had i had we we were having dinner together one night and so we were kind of like doing this mental like stuff with each other of, you know, what about this? What about that? What about this? Who about this? What about this person kind of thing? And he wound up becoming management for me for a while. Oh, cool. And he said, um, I know somebody in England that would love to get involved doing something with you. And I said, oh, who's that? Dee Harris from a group called Fashion. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, they had the album Fabrique mm -hmm. that was out. And did really well, did really well in cult scene here in America. Yeah, it was a big dance hit. Like they had a mm -hmm. lot of 12 inch. Uh, Love, Love yeah. Shadows was one of yeah. them. And, um, all of a sudden, here we go, Ken. Yeah. This, you know, going to England to work with somebody, to meet somebody and possibly work with somebody in England, you know, it's like, oh my God, here we go. Yeah. So I, I went over and, and I had some material. I had worked with, um, Holly Knight. Yeah, Holly doing a couple of things. Yeah, she's her. written some amazing. Oh, yeah, and Tina Turner's comeback stuff. Yes. she's written stuff for Roxette and Heart and mm -hmm. um, just yeah, huge songs. Uh, Pat Benatar, she yeah. Love Is a Battlefield. She had uh, she had sent a couple of songs my way. And, oh wow. um, That I was going to do. In fact, one of them I think I wound up doing on a demo that D and I did. So I had some material. I had a couple of things that I'd, I'd written with uh, John Palumbo. And, um, that I felt were pretty, pretty strong pieces and, uh, headed over to England to meet with D and, um, to go in the studio and do a little recording and just see, you know, how it would work. Hit it off like a house of fire. And we went into Dave Clark, F. Dave Clark <laughs> yeah. Five's studio. Electric Lady U Land, to the Jimi Hendrix studio to the Dave Clark Five studio. <laughs> uh, Utopia, uh, was the name of the studio. 
and we did a lot of work for the next three years. I wound up moving over to England, and we decided that definitely we should try and do a, a duo of some kind here and, and, and uh, work towards uh, getting a deal. And um, we did a ton of recording, ton of writing together, and um, we did we got some very good, viable offers, capital EMI, Warner Brothers there, uh, Warner Brothers uh, Publishing, um, RCA, you know, I'm looking at RCA right there. Oh, RCA yeah. was the first offer that they came to us and um, wanted to do a deal with. But unfortunately, we never signed with anybody to do anything. Mm. Um, D didn't feel that anything that was being offered was good enough. It wasn't right. It wasn't right. It wasn't good enough. It wasn't, you know, and I kept saying, we got to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, yes, I'm coming from this situation with the Prince camp, you know, and yeah. what I've been able to accomplish. You've had a great, you know, thing here with fa Fabrique and fashion. Yeah. You know, Let's we got to start somewhere. Let's take a step back and then yes. build it back up. Yeah. It, exactly. It doesn't mean that we have to stay there forever. Yeah. You know, we've got to, but we've got to start somewhere. And it just didn't happen. So did anything happen with that material? No. Oh. I'm sitting on on a catalog of stuff I've written with D. Harris. This is like early 90s, late 80s, early 90s. 80s. I have, I'm sitting on a catalog of things I wrote with John Palumbo. It's so different, but not really. I mean, I've yeah. can. I I've been looking, re-listening to some of this stuff and because I'm getting ready to start working towards doing another solo disc. There's no reason why I can't bring some of this in to, to this disc. Because the last one you did was, what, 2010, 2011 was the last solo disc? Yeah. And that was songs that you'd been working on for a long time, or was it songs that you... It was a culmination of, 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 peri of, of things I'd written over the period of time. Um, the oldest, actually, the oldest thing on there was something I wrote when I first came back from, moved back to the United States from England. Okay. Which is later in the 80s. And all the rest of it was stuff that I wrote. Um, in between that. Uh, after that period. You yeah. Know, up, to, up to when I went into the studio to record it. Because I do hear a lot of, like, on that record, it is sort of Bonnie Raitish um, in the best way. It's got that kind of mm -hmm. bluesy-ish vibe to it right. that's different from what you had been doing for the you know decade and a half before that it sounds right like. right exactly well i you know it's getting back to that kind of thing of you know i did as well as i did with the music that i was doing with right. the, with the print within the prince camp but at the same time it wasn't it wasn't me you know the stuff that i write is what we call now americana more americana and when you listen to my solo disc the songs there there's an eclectic mix of things like mm -hmm. for instance um Follow me. I call that my, um, that's my Ray Charles song. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. And, and then I've got something that is so very old school, um, country gospel coming back from my country roots. So there's a, a little, some of the influences of, of different things I've experienced and things that have, have come my way. Um, there's a song that I wrote with John Palumbo that I'm probably going to do on the disc. It's called uh, Gateway. And when you listen to it, it's very, it's almost, you can pick up my Beatles, uh, Eleanor Rigby kind yeah. of type thing. You know, that you can hear a little bit of something like that in it. When you, when you hear it, that's what you're going to hear. So, um. So it's interesting to be able to revisit this stuff mm. and, and see sort of with the, the benefit of time mm. to get kind of a perspective on it. Cause mm -hmm. it sounds like that kind of stuff was happening in a very, um, not chaotic's a little bit too negative a word, but a, a, a time when you were like, I kind of don't know what's going on. You're coming after this thing. And it seems like you're more settled now yeah. or a little more centered. Yeah. Uh, so you can kind of approach this stuff with a, with a different mindset. And, and well, yeah, the time has gone by and the experience has gone by. And one of the biggest main experiences for me over a very large period of time of my life is um, having a son mm -hmm. and raising a child. Um, I put everything aside. I put it away. Because I couldn't do both. Yeah, I couldn't be the mother I needed to that I felt I needed to be to raise my son and do a career at the same time. I I saw a lot of kids backstage growing up backstage, yeah. and I, that's not. It's yeah. you know, I mean, it has. There's some benefits there, but for myself personally, it's not what I wanted for my. Any, I never really thought I was going to have children. Yeah, and not that I didn't want to have children, but I just didn't think it was going to happen You're for me. Kind of busy. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time, I just didn't think it was something that was going to be a part of my life. Um, and when it happened, it was such a shock that it was going to. You know, I had to think about: Am I going to be a mom? Should I be a mom? Yeah. Will I be a mom? And, um, and I'm going to do this right if I'm going to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Like with exactly. everything else, that if we're going to do it, let's go all out <laughs> yeah. and do it. You know, if I'm going to put something into it, I'm going to put my all into yeah. it. You know. And I wonder, it's it's you know, I've had the luxury of since I started doing the show, getting to to speak with so many people whose work I've really loved over the years that are from New England and have their roots there and went out and made these huge ripples on the world. And you know, one of the things that I've one of the themes that sort of keeps coming up is a sort of 
grounded almost cynicism that we kind of get growing around here but it it's like a yeah this is great but you, you, we got to work for a living kind of thing where it's mm-hmm. and some of that kind of stems from like the whoa, whoa you think you're better than me <laughs> stuff that comes around here but it makes people really want to have that like oh if i'm gonna get this in if i'm gonna go on tour i'm gonna work while i'm on the road if you know mm-hmm. i'm gonna have a a, a a son i'm gonna i'm gonna make sure that i'm i'm doing it right and not taking maybe a shortcut of you know uh, yeah, a can't. nanny watch them while i'm doing my thing you right. know um, it, i was I, if i i felt if i was ever gonna have a child it was gonna be one child and that i was going to i wanted to be the one that was going to be able to participate in that in that way of be there mm-hmm. experience you know and i still my son is going to be 24 years old in another week or two and i still look at him and i still just find it so fascinating to know that i birthed this child i mean to have the responsibility of another human That's being thick. is an immense responsibility and and i guess my brother tells me i'm too deep <laughs> Well, that's the artist. I'm too you know? deep. I'm too serious. Yes. And, and Dylan even said to me, he said, well, you know, somebody who works with his hand is a laborer. Somebody who works with their hands, their heart, and their head is an artist. And my son's an artist. So your son, does he have like an opinion on the, the stuff that you've done over the years? Or is he seeing any of the stuff? I or? didn't. Um, one of the main reasons I had gone off the road and, and, and put the music uh, career aside when I realized I was, I was going to have this child and give him a chance at life, I really put it aside. Yeah. I, I hid it away. Well, I, while he was growing up, there was one incident. In fact, it's funny, he and I were just talking about this the other night. There was one time where he had a friend over, and I want to say he was about seven years old, six or seven years old, somewhere around there. And um, the television was on, and VH1 came on. <laughs> VH1, I don't know, I think they picked the channel. I don't know. I was in the other room doing other stuff. I yeah. wasn't paying attention until all of a sudden I hear my son saying, Mom! <laughs> and he never talks like that, and I just thought, I better investigate what this is. So I go in the other room, and I, and I, and I said, yeah, and I look, and there was where they are now, or... A past oh, yeah. thing, and yep. there is like there I am, yeah, uh, you know, with vanity on on the screen, <sighs> and it wasn't my son who said he was calling me because his friend was claiming it was you. Looked at looked at it and said, "Oh, there's your mom." <laughs> <laughs> but he probably would have been never even associated it. You know, yeah. and he, no, he probably never would have. And I don't think he was probably even looking at the screen because he wasn't quite, he has been, he's had an affinity for music since he was a baby. But what it was always, he was always attracted to more than anything else was soundtrack music from, yeah. from a movie or score. theme songs from, yeah, scores. And, um, but popular music, especially with anything that had vocals, singing, he didn't like voices. He right. didn't want, he just liked music instruments. And so he's kind of like looking at me to answer, to say, you know, <laughs> Sammy says that, you know, and I said, oh, um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and I turned around and walked away. And he was like, oh, I need to know. And he didn't believe me. Yeah. He, he didn't believe me. Well, and so, why would you? Could yeah. you imagine that? Like He couldn't. Yeah. I mean, he'd look at me and, you know, to look at what I looked like at that time, you know, and, and doing that gig. uh yeah, how could you relate? Very different talk that you have to have with your kid than most people. <laughs> We're gonna have the talk. And, and, and oh, not this I, one. Yeah. It's a different one. <laughs> and I, here I was in a small town, you know, um, raising this son. And some of the people in the area knew who I was and some of my background and accomplishment. I made music and whatnot. And but I never. I just kept very quiet and I yeah. kept pretty much to myself. And and did the things that you normally do. I mean, I took him to Boy Scouts and yeah. I took him here, I took him there. He was, he was involved in martial arts training. We were having that conversation a few minutes yeah. ago. He was, um, and he stayed, I, I put him into martial arts training at the age of six years old and said, you have no choice for the next 10 years. Yeah. You have to do this it's because I couldn't great. picture myself. I raised him as a single mom. Mm-hmm. I couldn't picture myself being in the backyard ch- teaching him how to put his fist up, you know, to, yeah. to learn how to fight or defend, defend, defend himself. And there's other things, um, being a martial artist yourself, you know, there's other things that go that are in it oh, absolutely. Uh, as part of, uh, work ethic and work, concentration. And right. the, the thing I found the most helpful is really with comedy is being able to read people mm-hmm. misdirection mm. and, um, knowing how to steer people to a certain outcome right because it's 
that's exactly what a lot of martial arts is. It's like counter balancing mm-hmm. and, you know, the, and, and surprise and that kind of stuff. And weirdly, I use that often <laughs> during right. comedy. But there's, a, there's also something else, too, that um, I liked, I thought was attractive, and I wanted my son to be exposed to with the martial arts. And that is, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Eh? Zen? The Zen part of yeah. it, too. You know, I mean, there's a... G. Yeah. yeah. There's a historical, yeah. it's almost spiritual kind of um, uh, sense that you get from it. I mean, one of his favorite sayings, and this kind of sums it up a little bit, in, in that um, what you're saying is, um, I'd rather be a warrior in a garden than in a garden, in, in a war, and not be, and be a gardener. <laughs> right. Or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, but anyway, he... Um, so I, I I kept it. I it had it, it didn't have a place. Yeah, you know the, my past experience it didn't have a place yet. In and you his weren't life. making music. Or, and I or wasn't making music. Was... I wasn't doing anything. My guitar was in the case under the bed, getting dusted. Yeah, you know, I mean, gathering dust rather. And and um, and I started becoming involved with um the church choir just as an, I was kind of pulled into it to do it. And um, they wanted a ringer. And well, no, um. <laughs> They just, they heard me singing in the congregation yeah. one day and said, oh, you got to sing with the choir. And they finally talked me into giving it a try in the Christmas program. The theme. And <laughs> they heard you sing and conscripted you in. <laughs> Here we <Yep>. go. Yeah. <laughs> and I, um, so I stayed with it. 15 years later, I'm still doing it, but it's, I've, there's so much I've learned from it. It's such a different exercise for your voice, mm-hmm. uh, doing choral and, and doing secular sing, you know, music. I, 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 I love it. There's some beautiful, beautiful music to, and, um, it's really helped me in my stuff, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I was doing that and keeping exercise in that way. And as Dylan got a little bit older and a little bit older, um, I started thinking about whether I should take any baby steps back into doing any music. And and I had and I really looked at it in a different way this time around. Mm-hmm. I looked down the road in the past and, and thought, you know, if I decide that I do get involved with music, I'm going to do what I want to do. And I'm going to do it in my way. Mm -hmm. Because up to that point, you know, I was blessed to have been able to be given an opportunity. But when, while I was in the opportunity, it was very difficult, sometimes as a woman too, to be able to call a shot. Yeah. Per se, you know? And so I went with the flow and I learned and I gathered and I, and I um, maintained and survived. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, I felt that if I was going to do it, I wanted to do it, you know, my way. Right. And, um, because I felt that I had learned enough that I could do it. And technology had c- kind of caught up a little bit, I think, too, <laughs> where you, you had the, the means, probably, because you didn't need a billion-dollar record label to back you to get into a studio you know, yes. to be able to do that kind of stuff. Right. And, and yeah, it gave, it's a, there's a whole new outlet there where you can do I mean, if you have the money, it still costs the money, part of it, you've yeah. got to deal with. But still, at the same time, it's available to the public, to anybody who has the creativity and wants to put something out. You know, and there are those engines that you can get the uh, your stuff listened to mm-hmm. by the by the out there by the public um, nationally and internationally. But when I started writing again, and I took my guitar out and dusted it off and started writing some more, I would be in the other room while he was in one room with his friends playing. I'd be in the other room and I'd be playing and carrying on. So he heard that, mm-hmm. so he knew that I was musically inclined. But as far as what I had done in my past uh, background, he had no idea. I have photo albums galore of I stuff. Bet. I've got all this, but it's he's never you know been curious to say, oh, what's that, you know? Until I got a phone call from Susan Moonsey one day. Okay. <laughs> and we hadn't seen each other in quite a while. We'd been talking for ages and ages and years over the phone and whatnot, but we had not been able to actually be together face to face. She had uh, gone back to Trinidad and was living there, so we were pretty far apart. And uh, she was calling to say she had some time, some free time, and she wanted to come see me. She wanted to come for a visit. And I said, absolutely. Yeah. So she came for a visit. She stayed for almost two weeks. And as it so happens, Prince happened to be on tour at the time. <laughs> And he was going to be playing three shows here in Boston. At, at the Garden. No, it wasn't the Garden. It oh, was, the smaller uh, shows? No, it was, um, I want to say the um, Bank of America 
Yeah, yeah, um, the, the pavilion. Pavilion, I yep. guess. Um, it's called something different now. Yeah, it changed. That's another thing that didn't used to happen in the old days where, <laughs> you know, if this was the venue, that was the venue. Every year, I don't know what the venues are called now. It's I like know. the Subway Arena. And I'm like, <laughs> the Dunkin' Donuts Center. I'm like, well, okay. Yeah. So uh, she she shows up and I said, do you realize that the prince is right around the corner here on tour? And she had no idea because mm-hmm. she was totally out of the loop. And um, she goes, well, what do you want to do? Do you want to go see him? And I said, yeah, I'm thinking about it. And I'd made some inroads of making some, when I knew she was coming and I realized yeah. that he was around, um, I started making some inroads into, you know, let's get into the show somehow and yeah. see and get in, getting into, because we had kind of, by that time, I, when I say that I forgot everything and put everything aside, everything yeah. was gone. I had no contact with anybody in business except for with Susan. Yeah. That was it. I wasn't going to be active and I just, it was a part of my life that had to go away. I wasn't in touch with him, nobody but her. And, and that's a pretty hard fortress to get a message through to or to get back into, I imagine. He's, you know, the, it's like, it's like the layers of an onion. Yeah. You know, you can't, even if he wants to see you and wants you to be there, you know, trying to get to him to let him know that you're around yeah. is, you're lucky sometimes. It's like that, a head of know. state. Yeah. I made a lot of phone calls and talked to a lot of different people and, and finally was able to get to a, to a, at least a certain point. And um, right up until the day before, the night before the second show, it was the, it was the night of the first show that he was doing here. Um, we had a few people over for dinner. Susan's a fabulous cook, and she'd made this wonderful, wonderful curry dinner. Oh, very nice. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I never eat curry dinner unless she's cooking it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so we had a few friends over, and, and it was a fabulous night. And, the, you know, we're there talking. Oh, we should go. You know, you should go this and do that and whatnot. And Susan said, why don't we just buy tickets? And I said, hell no, I'm not going to go to a Prince show. <laughs> buy a ticket to go see Prince. <laughs> that is really you know, weird. Like it, yeah. Because I want to walk in to see the man, you know, yeah. before the show and so on and so forth. So... We, um, you know, finished the night and I went to bed, she went to bed. And the next morning, about 6.30 in the morning, I opened the door to her room where she was, where I had her staying. And I said, get your ass up, let's go. What are we doing? We're going to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Road trip. And she said, what do you, what do, uh, what do we do? I don't know. I'm going to make it up as we go. Just yeah. get up. Let's go. So, um, all the way up here, you know, she's saying, what are we going to do? I mean, what are you going to, and I said, well, first of all, we're going to go to, the, we're going to head for the production office. Yeah. You know, so I, I knew the steps. Yeah. You know, I still You've been remember the, the steps. Yeah. You know, I knew the places where to head and, and who to ask for and who to talk to, you know. And we got to a certain point where, you know, there's all these people and they're looking at us, you know, and granted, I don't look the same as I did some, how many <laughs> years back. You can tell But, you know, and Susan, you can't, she's, the, anybody that knew that era, that band, that, you know, she's a dead ringer for who she is. And um, finally, she got, she started getting angry. She's yeah. getting ticked off now, you know. She starts putting her foot down and demanding, you know, and, and that's all it took, really. And um, so we were sat, we sat down. They, they arranged for us to have seats and stuff like this. And no kind of backstage pass or anything like this. And I said, this isn't ended. This is not ending here, I'm telling you that. We had nice seats. Yeah, I bet you were. It was a big stage. Yeah. It was he had it in the in the center of the arena. Yeah, I was I was at the huge shows. stage. Yeah. Like, oh, you were. Yeah, yeah. So you see, I saw it was like ten feet off the yeah, ground. Yeah, it was kind huge. Of thing. Yeah, and um, we had really good seats. We were even with the stage where we were, and we we're just sitting there. And um, it was off to the end, going into the underneath the the, the, the locker rooms where and everything. They had this sort of um, entryway set up black awning that came out from into the hall into the floor of the hall and um there was this huge guy he must have been like six 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 eight big black guy in a big suit and all the head set and you know and i and i'm sitting there next to susan and i just jabbed her with my elbow and i said keep your eye on this guy watch this guy and he's very nonchalantly walking across the floor and he came right exactly to us she was sitting next to me on the end of the aisle and he looked at her and said, are you Brenda? <laughs> and I wanted to say, what the? <laughs> I've changed quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, go back and do your homework, you know? Uh, she said, no. And she pointed it to me. And he looked at me and he said, please come with me. And I said, all right, Susan, this is it. Let's go. So she came with me and he took us back downstairs, across the floor, over to this awning that I'd seen. It was like a real tunnel type yeah. setup. And he tried to stop me right there at the end of the tunnel and said, wait here. Yeah. But like you with the light behind you when we first started, the light from the hall was behind this person that was standing at the other end of this little tunnel. 
and I knew exactly who it <laughs> yeah. was. There was no mistake. Very specific silhouette. You know, I just pushed the guy out of the way, <laughs> and I started walking, and then I got within four feet of Prince, and he just opened his arms, and yeah. just and that was the first time I'd seen him in such a long time. But was it like you hadn't? Doing it was like no time passed, kind of exactly. Thing? Yeah, you know, and um, but he didn't see Susan. He saw me, right? And opened his arms to me, and we go walking into the hall. In the, to the light and everything, he said, you know, I know it, it, they kept saying, Brendan, I wasn't so sure it was you, and I'm really sorry, and I'm so happy to see you, and all this. And then, and I said, yeah, and not only that, but look at this. And she comes walking out of the end of the tunnel. <laughs> and I thought he was going to have a heart attack right there. Again, surprising Prince. Oh, You've done God. it again. <laughs> 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 it was it was just amazing. And um you know, it was it, it was like little kids. You know, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. We couldn't say it. we were all talking at once, and um, it was such a happy time. And uh, so he says, "Okay, come on, let's go down there. Let's go talk, and let's 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 go sit down here, and then let's do this, and let you know." And um, for one of the first things you want to know is how many kids do you have, and how many kids do you have? <laughs> right, and, right. And um, Susan has two children. She has a boy and a girl, and I just have the one with Dylan. And uh, when he found out that I had had a son, he said, well, where is he? Why isn't he here? Why isn't, you know, because he knew I was not, I was close by. And right. um, I said, well, we weren't really quite sure what was going to happen tonight. <laughs> no, we were so, going to get in. <laughs> yeah. So I, I didn't, didn't want to drag him along in case we had a sure thing here. So we spent an hour or two with him in the, in the dressing room and then saw the show. Yeah. It was fabulous, of course. Yeah. And, um, loud. Oh, my God. I think when he had, like, Maceo Parker playing with him. Yes. And, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It was a loud uh, show. Yeah. 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 Yes. It was excruciatingly painful. Yeah. And he, when we saw him later on that night afterwards at the after party thing that he had, he wanted to know right away, well, what do you think? How did it sound? How do well, you know? And I said, you got to turn it down. Yeah. I have no idea. I said, that was painful. I had to find somebody that had cigarettes. Yeah. And I borrowed Shovel. two cigarettes <laughs> and broke the filters off and stuck them in my ears. <laughs> But he wanted to meet Dylan in the worst way. Wow. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, you do have one more show. And he said, uh, he said, I'll take care of it. He set us up in a hotel for the next night and sent a car down to pick us up. Wow. So not I. Not a blue limousine. Not a blue limousine. <laughs> it was a black one. Yep. And, um, so I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. And I had said to Dylan, I said, you need to come with us. We're going to, we're going to go to Boston to, to see a show. I didn't tell him what kind of show it was. <laughs> How and old was he at this point? I think he was like 10. Okay. <laughs> I think he was somewhere around 10. And, um, and I said, um, I said, I'm not driving. We have a ride. Somebody's going to pick us up. Oh, okay. And he's just, <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You know, and, um, so uh, the guy that had the driver call me on the cell, from a cell phone when he got there. And I was sure to be the one out in the yard first when, uh, when it was time to go and to see the look on my son's face when he came outside and saw a limousine sitting there. Yeah. And he just couldn't believe it. Mom, that's a limousine. <laughs> I know. Is that all right? <laughs> yes, it is. Did we win something? And he said, Oh my gosh. So he said, Come on, get in the car. So he gets in the car and his grandparents live a couple of blocks away from us. Yeah. Mom, can we go by Nanny and Pop? <laughs> can we show them this car? And I said, Yeah, sure, we got time. So I had them go by and um they were thrilled to death. They had no idea. They saw this big limousine pulling up in front of the house. Yeah. And they were like, what is this? And they saw Dylan and I getting out of the car. <laughs> they see a driver get out. Yeah. And then they see him opening the door and we get out. And they is just, Ed what McMahon going to get out? Did we <laughs> 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 And And um, we, we went up to the show. And it was one we were at the show. Uh, on the way up there, Dylan was funny. He got in the car. Well, we start heading down the road. And he sits in the back and he stretches his legs out. And he crosses his arms in front of him. And he looks back at me. He looks at Susan on the other side and he goes, I could get used to this. <laughs> you know, and Susan and I both at the same time said, well, get your education and get a good yeah. job and you can own one of these too. Yeah. Um, so we get, uh, it was on the way up there though. I told him, I said, we're going to go see Prince. Prince? I said, yeah, have you ever heard of him and heard his music? And he says, yeah, I kind of, I think so. And I said, well, that's where we're going to go here. And he said, oh, I used to work with him. What? <laughs> And so I told him a little bit, but I didn't yeah. tell him too much because I wanted him to just see the music. Yeah, know? yeah. So we saw the show. We didn't get to see him before the show this time around. However, he had us, he arranged for us to be um, at the aftermath, at the after party again as well. And the, I can't, rem I don't think I ever knew the name of the place that he had um, hired 
to have the after party. I think it was Avalon, maybe. Or it was a club. club. It was a big club downstairs, but there was a whole private section to it <laughs> yeah. that was upstairs where yep. you could look out over, and they had separate rooms. Yep. There was a separate bar. Yeah, and that's so Avalon. Yeah, okay. it was on two levels. Yeah. Okay. Yep, on Lansdowne Street behind the Boston, um, the Fenway Park. Okay. Yep. Yep. And um, we got there, and we were upstairs, and we were playing pool, and one of the rooms had a pool table. And Prince came in, and Susan and I could have jumped off a bridge. Yeah. For all he knew that we were there anymore at that point. He made a beeline for my son, <laughs> stuck his hand out, introduced himself, and Dylan in- introduced himself back, and that was it. Prince dominated the time with Dylan <laughs> just the whole rest of the night that we were there. And we were there like 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And he was just talking a blue streak about music and about this and about that, because my son... um one of the reasons of taking going off the road is that I wanted him to, if he was going to have any involvement with music, I wanted him to find the music mm-hmm. or the music to find him. I didn't you didn't want, want him going the family business. Well, I didn't right. want him growing up. Uh, you know, he heard me playing at home. Yeah. Kind of thing, like I did with my parents and stuff like that. But I didn't want him knowing anything but being backstage all the time growing up and all, you know. Not what real world experience. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Kind of a normal yeah. life, maybe. So, um, he was playing out. If, uh, music did, he did find music. Music found him, uh, with a whole affinity towards scoring and stuff like this. But he also picked up his first instrument was violin. Okay. When he was four. So he was more classically inclined. And then he, um, picked up alto sax and played in the jazz bands. And, um, when my mother passed away, she left her piano to him and he took lessons for two years and he still plays piano to this day. So, um, so he, he did get involved with music. So yeah. when Prince heard that he played sa- alto sax, he turned around, and looked at me. Have, have, <laughs> I'm sorry. It's quite all right. <laughs> have you been playing him any Charlie Parker? <laughs> and I said, and, and, and Dylan no. goes, who's Charlie Parker? And he, and Prince went, <laughs> you know, looked at You're me, in trouble. What do you mean? <laughs> Why aren't you? But, you know, and it, obviously the musical education wasn't up to par. <laughs> right, right. For Prince's uh, taste or whatever. <laughs> and um, But we had a great time. And well, throughout the whole conversation, I and mean, Susan and I are over off to the side and we're watching and we're carrying and doing whatever <laughs> we're doing. But I was also trying to listen to what yeah. was going on there too. I was very interested in what the conversation was about. And there was whatever was being talked about. I all of a sudden heard Dylan say to Prince, so, is this what mom's life was like? Yeah. Is this what it was like for her? Yeah, and Prince just kind of looked at me and looked at him and said, yeah, this is, what she, this is the kind of life that she lived. And it kind of finally came home to Dylan a little right. bit more. This after was a real being thing. There. Yeah. Yes, and seeing a show and being, yeah. in, and he'd never been to anything of that, like that before. He'd been to the circus, but yeah. not any kind of a musical thing like this. It's especially. like finding out your mom was a superhero or something. <laughs> you know, it's like a, that's a whole uh, double life kind of thing when yeah. you see that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you're right. So then he was cool with it after that. Well, he was cool with it, but he still, you know, after we went home, it was back to him being in his own environment. Yeah. So, and because I wasn't active doing anything, yeah. he just, he didn't really have much to say about it in the fact that he thought it was cool. Yeah. I thought it was cool, Mom. And um, he never asked, we never had that conversation of how come you're not doing that now or why are you going to do it again or right. anything like this. And I think it went on in, um, in that way until he was um, you know, like 15, 16 years old and I was finding that I was having more time to myself. Mm-hmm. You know, where I could make a decision of whether I did want to become involved with the music in, in any other way besides the choir. Right. And, um, it's one of those things where you get, once again, you got to be careful what you put out there in the universe because it's listening. And next thing I know, I got a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, one of the guitar players, fabulous, fabulous guitar player that I worked with with Tombstone, Paul DiChiara, he had passed away. So they were doing a, um, a kind of um like a tribute show yeah kind of like a tribute thing but they what they did they did it in a way where they contacted with the the different groups of people and things that he'd been involved right. with like a this is your life irish week kind of thing <laughs> it, it, i guess so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he um the director that put this this whole thing together um, put it together like that with um, a little bit of every, trying to put gather all the people that had been in these bands that, that Paul had had worked in and worked people we worked with and um, he asked he call, he was calling to ask if I would do uh, the portion with Ken and whoever else was survived from that band. Mm-hmm. There's three of the seven people, almost four of the seven people that passed away wow. from that group. But um, 
And I said, sure, for Polly, okay, yeah, I'll do this. Then all of a sudden I went, ooh. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> oh, I really have to do it now. <laughs> yeah. You know, I had to dig a little deep to, 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 to put myself in a different mindset again, you know, to, to go back in time or... Um, and, and I certainly did question myself. Oh my God, can I do this? Yeah. One night, you know, a set's worth of music. Yeah, I, I think I can yeah. do this. And I did it. Um, and it was fun, but it felt alien to me because I'd been away from it for yeah. so long. Been a civilian 15, for 15, 16 <laughs> years. Yeah. And, um, and after that, D uh, Don Culp, DC Culp played drums, um, for the Tombstone segment. And, um, he was talking with the director that, that had put this whole thing together afterwards and said, you know, um, we really should do something for Ken, who had, oh, at that time, had over 40 some odd years in the music business. Wow. So, you know, why wait until he passes away right. and do something now that he can be a part of that is kind of like honoring his, you know, because a lot of people did, Scott Hamilton was one of the people, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, that went through working with Kenny that went on to do something on his own. Um, there's a couple other people I can't bring their names to mind at the moment, but... Um, he was a, a, a wealth of alumni. <laughs> Duke Robillard, um, if, you, if you know of him. Yes, I've heard that. Okay. So we did, this show was created. Yeah. The talent pool exists the with talent, connections to Yes. <laughs> and um, we did this show. It was at, um, it was in, it was a place in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. And the place sold out. It was like almost a thousand people showed up. Wow. This, this gig, this show. And it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, but it was a lot of fun. And they set it up in, in different periods of time, you know, of, okay, this is his folk genre and from the sixties. And then yeah. it went into this and then went in he, and he got very involved with Celtic music, the Pendragon group for, 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 for a while. And, um, and he did a, a sort of country type thing for a little bit then and then we came to the the, the uh, tombstone segment the blues the blues segment and um it was so successful and made such an impact that um kenny said geez you know what we've got the momentum let's do some more stuff and people were approaching him to right. do more things as well and so i was asked if i would continue staying with it and um I said, as long as I'm having fun. Yeah. Sure. Why not? I'll give it a try. I wanted to do it to see, okay, here's a vehicle for me to, here you go, Brenda, here's a test for you. Right. Really. Um, see if you can do it. Yeah. You, kind if of you're get having back these, shape. <laughs> right. And if you're having these kind of thoughts of entertaining going back in towards the, you know, music stuff again, here's an opportunity okay. again for here's you. Here's a low to, risk kind of opportunity. Yeah. To get back in. yeah. You didn't, you're not committing to a huge right. tour or anything. It's, right. Yeah. Right. So I did, um, and I worked with them for two years. And we did, every time you know, I turned around, they were asking me for another original you know, song to do with the group. And uh, one of the girls that was working with us, Lori Lakeo, um, who has a, a studio of her own, recording studio of her, of her own, um, started talking to me about the, my tracks. And have you laid any tracks down on this material? And I, and I said, no, I haven't really. I just, you know, they've all been in, sitting in the folder. Right. And um, so she started talk, working on me to, you know, you got to get in the get studio. Get this recorded. You know, and all this business. And I said, yeah, it's going to be a good idea. I'd like to do that. You know, and finally I said to her after, towards the, to the end of those two years, I, it purely comes down to finances. Yeah. You know, I don't have money for studio time. Lori. Yeah. I'd love to step into your studio and work on this stuff. She did it for nothing. Yeah. She offered to do it for nothing. How can you turn that down? Yeah, you can. Yeah. And it's, it's, again, these things just work out sometimes. Mm -hmm. It's, it's odd how it's like the right thing happens at the right time. Right. Yeah. And, um, so I said, all right. And it started, it was going to, it started, the project started out to be just like a, like a little, a, a five song demo type yep. sort of recording kind of thing. But, um, I was pulling out this song out of the bucket and this song out of the folder. And, and I see, I really want to do this. And then when she wasn't hearing the songs we'd done in the group, well, what about follow me? What about yeah. this one? You know, what about cry me a river? You know? And I said, well, you know, she goes, we got to do it. And I said, look, this is your dime. Yeah. And, and in the end, it wound up a 10 song disc. Yeah. And, uh, I did, it was the first time ever in, I was able to do what I had wanted to try to do, which was, Soup to nuts. Yeah. It was my project. Yeah. And it was the kind of music you want to play. I mean, after several different bands and, mm -hmm. and several different genres, you, you, right. you finally were able to do it at that this point. This is what you hear is what came out of my heart. Yeah. You know? And that's, that's how, that's how I write. I write yeah. from my heart. Oh, I'll have a song at the end of the show for people to check oh. it out and I'll put all the links to all your stuff in there. Oh, nice. Thank but, you. um, yeah, it's, and I'm a huge soul music fan. Mm. And I, it, it, so instantly when I listened to it, I was like, this reminds me so much of like Irma Thomas stuff. Oh. 
times and like uh that kind of stuff so it's uh it's very much in my up my alley so (laughs) So, but very different from anything i'd heard you do in the past with the stuff i was familiar with right and and this is one of the things once i finished the project and and i i got it out out there and into ether space yeah um and word got out i mean well when doing the show for the tombstone um for ken's um for ken's show there in winsocket um there was some buzz generated mm-hmm. and before you knew it it was going over the airwaves somewhere right. somewhere along the line the world's so much smaller she's now. back yeah <laughs> she's singing again you know yeah. and that was that was the first group of things uh that i was getting is oh she's singing that's so great i'm so glad that she's doing this again or she's opened her you know she's come right. back and showed up and so when i when i made myself uh my stuff available out there um i got a lot of really nice only one time one comment of anything I heard was of a negative nature. That's everything else. That unusual was in the internet age, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, where people have a, the anonymity power to write whatever they want to whoever they want. Right, exactly. Uh, trust me, I've discovered that. <laughs> yeah. Serious. Uh, oh yes, yes. <laughs> but that's great. I mean, that's yeah. the the great part of you know the world is so much smaller, mm-hmm. but at the same time, um, you know, people can find you, but also people can find you. <laughs> they can find yeah. you stuff right and, and you don't um, have to slog it out so much i was very uh i was curious to see you know if there was it had been such a long time i didn't know if there was still any of the fans from right. the prince uh camp you I'm know sure there were and they all started you know i started getting all this you know oh you, you were so good with this and you were the best there or i liked you here or any of that kind of thing and, and it was all great positive stuff so yeah. it, it was a good feeling to know that okay you know you this and this because it's such a wide open space it's mm-hmm. such a wide open market and it and it's it gets to the masses in such a way and in, in, in that um that medium um i i felt well you know at least there'll be somebody out there who will like yeah. some of this you know and uh, as i'd mentioned it's such an eclectic mix of of um flavors with this disc that um well genre seems so um not antiquated but people don't seem to really care as much about it mm-hmm. as much anymore so it's kind of it's which is a good thing match. yeah it's yeah. everyone's just kind of like yeah that's what that person sounds like right. and it's not and i and i imagine when you were dealing with labels in the 70s and 80s they were like we need this specific thing and mm-hmm. you know there's a black chart right. and there's the top 40 but that's you know and there's it's a very, dance chart and yeah it's this, so uh, yeah. segregated and now none yeah. of that it's a yeah no it's one big it's one big pot of so you can kind of do whatever whatever yeah exactly <laughs> yeah. and so your plan is to kind of dig back and some of that stuff that you had the, yep before. i would like to do that um because there's there are some things that when you when i listen to it it's um it could be co- considered classic in the sense that it it's uh not so time oriented yeah. to oh that's a specific oh that's an 80 song yeah that's an 80 whatever and um and they're not so complicated the songs are the music is not so complicated that i can't bring it up to specs a little bit right neither right you know there too um there's a tendency for me to feel you know, like okay that was then yeah this is what i did just completely cut ties yeah. there there it is it's going to stay there and just continue to create and go forward and do new things you know I, I'm, I'm very much like that right so um and, and i'm working on some stuff ed and i are starting to work on working on a little bit of a um rockabilly song called Summertime oh cool Time Love. oh cool and um did you ever see wanda jackson when you were growing up she, i probably did she uh she dated elvis for a bit but she was like a, trying to think of a, a female rockabilly woman and uh she was like i remember seeing her as a kid because again women didn't have electric guitars mm-hmm. and it's crazy rockabilly right. stuff from the 50s and oh, she's gosh. like really it's like oh, should, harsh in a good way she yeah. listen to a couple of that, wanda right? jackson yeah check yeah, her out yeah she still good. plays sometimes mm-hmm. um, i think she's but, coming around here uh to new england in wow. the next couple months yeah she's in her 80s I think. oh my god well see that's a you know i'm fa- i'm certainly not the young um young woman that i was when i was working in the 80s with the prince um, organization and and doing everything I was doing there. Time has gone by. Time is marching on. And um, you know, I look at at myself sometimes and go, "Do you want to be doing this?" You know, it's like when you when you used to hear the stories from Rolling Stones of you know, I'm not going to be doing a yeah. rock and roll thing when I'm like blah blah blah. <laughs> well, look what's but, happened. But yeah. look what happened. It just goes to show it's not that you're trying to make a comeback or any uh, that kind of a thing. It's more of like. And it's not a, a thing of a has been. I look at it as a used to be. Yeah, but used to and be. And I want to join the party. Yeah. You know, it, it, because it's something that's in me. It's something I want to do. What level I want to do it at, I don't, I don't feel at this time that, um, um, I certainly don't 
want to be on a club circuit. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just... You just want to make music again. I just want to make music. Yeah, and do it the way that you and want to do it. And put it out there. Yeah. And do a few shows that are, you know, um, a good, comfortable... Show. Yeah. I'm not, I don't want to be having to buy, you know, people to buy, have to buy alcohol and drinks and, yeah. and whatever dinners or whatever, that kind of a, of thing. But, um, but you kind of had to, I think, you know, listening to the, I'm being picky. Sorry. Yeah, no, but you can. <laughs> I mean, I'm like that with comedy, you know, uh-huh. I, I, people think I'm nuts, the stuff I turned down, but I'm like, I don't, even though that paid well, that sounds awful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or like, that doesn't seem like it would have been fun or I wouldn't have been able to do the kind of stuff that I would want to do. I would have to do right. stuff that people who were hiring me wanted me to do for the thing. Right. And I'm, you know, I'm not doing that. Right. And when I listen to your more recent stuff, it sounds more like, you had to be the age you are to make that stuff. Like you kind of oh, had to I grow see, the, into that um, nice way person to be can, able yes. to kind of do that nice style of that. music. So you, you had to go through all those experiences and take the little pieces. This of is the product of that experience. Yeah, really. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, I, um, from, you know, this point forward, I, you know, I got the call this time last year that uh, I had been voted in to be inducted into the Rhode Island Music Hall of Fame. And they asked if I would perform. And I said, certainly, I didn't feel, I felt it was, you know, the, it, it was like a slam dunk. Of course you can perform. Yeah. You've got to perform. And it's been such a big chunk of time in between performances for me that it's, it's always like, I get my mind, the mindset going into yeah. a different thing again. But it was fun. Ed, um, here, who's with me today, he's, yeah. this is Ed McGurl, by the way, and he's a multi instrumentalist, um, great songwriter and singer. And, um, he, uh, came on board as one of the people in the backup band. Um, my brother did, um, and the group of people that I asked and brought together to do this, we had such a great time. Yeah. Such a lot of fun. And um, we're doing it again. Um, we're going to do a show at a really nice listening club at the Common Fence Music Series in Portsmouth, Rhode Island next May. Yeah. And um, it's that kind of a thing. That, it's you on know, your terms, though. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's not because you have to. It's because right. you want to. And it doesn't to. have to be something with, you know, like Joe, Joe Lewis Arena with 40,000 people. Yeah. I just, you know. Once you do that, you don't necessarily need to do that again. Right. <laughs> 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 well, to to wrap up here, you know, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you again for doing this. Um, I always ask musicians when I have on the show what their favorite TV theme song is, because so many people I know, uh, when they're kids and you can't really get your parents to take you to a record store and buy you music, their first love ends up being a TV theme song. And a lot of times they'll watch the show because that's where they get to hear the song they right. like. <laughs> so almost everyone has one. Do you have one that comes to mind? Uh, well, actually, when you just mentioned it, uh, the first thing that came to my mind was the Star Trek theme. Really? So yes. instrumental. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That is a weird one. Yeah. Yeah. Did you watch Star Trek all the uh, time? I sure did. Yeah. I thought it was fantastic. I mean, here we were all of a sudden, you know, facing a, a space age kind of thing that was coming around into our lives. And, um, and that this, this, the, the, they chose to have a show that represented that, um, a science fiction show. And, and it was when, when you look at some of the old shows now and you see, you can almost hear sometimes in the background, somebody dropping something behind the oh, set, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and some of the, the kind of kitschy things that, that happened. But, um, it was a very idealistic utopian view of the future. Yeah. yeah. But I, I thought it was great because it was going to be coming down the line somewhere yeah. anyway, you know. Now we all have tricorders, basically. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Cell phones are pretty much exactly <laughs> like that. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much of a, I mean, I remember hearing a, I think it was an interview one time with um, William Shatner. And he was talking about Ray Bradbury and, yep. and, and all this and just, and, and it was something along the remark. One of the things he was mentioning was along the lines of, um, you know, a lot of the, you know, you got to face it. A lot of the ideas and things that you've read in these old, older science fiction books were, are now starting to come to pass. You mm-hmm. know, it's almost like they were, um, you know, the forerunner of uh, where people got ideas to try and do these yeah. things, you know. So I just, um, you know, I'm all for progress. I'm, and it's almost, contradictory again where um i'm such a uh, traditionalist right in a lot of ways but i'm always still open for the new yeah i think you can have the same roots but the way that you the way that you grow it mm-hmm. can be new and more efficient and or how you a can blend way. the two yeah you know you know like an east meets west old meets new kind of thing yeah you know that's the thing i always i've seen this to rachel a couple of weeks ago we saw you know those hoverboards people have now mm. those kids everyone got them for christmas mm-hmm. so i always kids run but 
the thing that science fiction always gets wrong is when they show the future, everything's new. And that's not the way it works. So if someone has a really amazing piece of technology, like a 3D printer, which is crazy, mm -hmm. it'll be in an old office right. and everything else will be, you know, it's a mixture of stuff. Right. And it's weird to see that sort of creep up or, you know, we walk around the dog at night and you look in a, uh, you know, an old uh, cape house and it's, you know, an older couple and they have, you know, their Afghan on the couch, but yeah. then they have a wall sized flat screen TV. You know, it's, <laughs> it's this really weird mixture of things and it's, uh, you know, and it seems right that it, it yeah. all kind of works. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so it so. doesn't have to be a complete cut to, <laughs> to the future. Right. Well, I've certainly enjoyed this time with you today. Thank you so um, much. It's been very interesting and, um, um, I'm still looking. Taking in all the stuff, yeah. I'm still looking around <laughs> and, um, I'm still uh, doing things out there and I don't think uh, I'll ever put music totally aside again. Yeah, you can't. I mean, I think if it's, if it's something you truly have in you and you have to do it, you do it. Well, that, that was one of the things that, um, Keith Urban was very responsible for lighting the fire of my creativity again. Mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to meet with him and um, it was very, very short meeting. Um, and he didn't really know who I was or, you know, in terms of my background and right. any accomplishments or any of that thing. But I had told him that I'd been involved with music at one time, that I'd been really thinking about taking steps back towards it again. And, uh, you know, what do you think of that? You know, especially when you, life was so immersed for a while. And he said, and it was very simple. He got very, he was very close, you know, we're like this far away from each yeah. other. We were like a foot away from each other. He put his arm around my shoulder and he just said to me, if it's in your heart, baby, to do it, you got to do it. Yeah. You know, and just the way he said it, when he said it, how he said it, what he said, just, you know, it, it hit home. Yeah. It, it was, was sincere. It, it wasn't right a platitude there. that he was like, no, yeah. Exactly. And it just, it wasn't, you know, and, um. And I just said, you're right. I said to myself, you're yeah. right. But, and so I did wind up doing some things. Yeah. And, and that was the first thing I did was, uh, it's, uh, some friends of mine that I've been working with had a country band that they were doing stuff on the side. So you went back all the way back. All the way back. Yeah. <laughs> all the way back. You got to start from put the a, starting put line. Put some get... tunes together. Um, not of my own because it was, it, it was something that came up very quickly. Yeah. And sat in with them and, um, then it started going from there. Yeah, you get the taste again, and then you're mm. right back, right back into it. Yeah, and then the thing with the tombstone thing came down along the line. Again, stuff kind of falling into your lap, but once yeah. it does, you you take you know you take the initiative, and you have to be there for it. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And Lori ad offered what she did with the solo situation, and and it was kind of like a little kick in the butt. Yeah. You know, saying Sometimes okay, you need someone to get do out that. there and yeah. do it, Brenda. Yeah. yeah. Kind of, cool. Yeah, well, I'm so glad they thank did. You. You're so, so welcome. Much. Thank you so much. Thank you. She sees her faces change considerably, or so she thinks. Whoa, to my mama, come away from the looking glass. Hey, to my mama, girl, there's no need for. You go that was brenda bennett a little bit more of her music there as we came out of the episode uh really love talking to her as you can probably tell uh in addition to her solo record acapella that came out a few years ago that we talk about in the episode she's been uh, down in new york lately working with songwriters uh charlie mason and man's ek uh on some dancier stuff and i, I want to note that uh, charlie was really instrumental in helping me uh get in touch with brenda and uh getting her on the show so i cannot thank him enough uh she's kind of doing some dancier stuff these days uh they uh produced and sang vocals on a uh, guiltier and private party which are really cool songs that you want to check out if you especially if you like the sort of princier stuff uh the vanity apollonia days it's it's more along those lines i've really liked everything i've heard her do so um you can't really go wrong uh one of those songs was remixed um by some dance club uh guys uh J Mai and mighty d who i think i'm pronouncing those correctly um was a huge hit down in the clubs down there so i'm told i'm not uh, frequenting the clubs in New York these days, uh, but um, doesn't surprise me. They're they're great songs. Uh, her latest record just came out in November a few months ago, uh, and it's the third in a series of songs she did with Mason. Uh, it's a different side of her vocal range, which is which is really nice. Uh, it's a little little softer. Uh, I think you'll like it very much. So yeah, just Google that stuff. It, it'll be very easy to find. And as she mentioned, she's doing some shows in New England in May, so you can go find those as well. Definitely go see her live if you have the chance, and you can see me live as well uh, if you go to TVGuidanceCounselor.com and 
sign up for our email list. I don't email very often, but when I do, it's, it's good stuff. So you can go there. You can tweet to me at TV guidance, or you can email me at TV guidance counselor at gmail.com or CandidateIcanRead.com, whichever you prefer. Uh, you can go to our Facebook page, just search TV guidance counselor and like us on there. You can like Brenda on there as well. Thank you guys so much for listening. We have a brand new episode every Wednesday and we'll see you again next time on TV guidance counselor. Any place that I don't take, I tend to feel a pain. And because I just won't break, I'm probably insane. And if it isn't all that it could be, it's okay. Instead of let regretting get to me, I stop and say, Hey, it's okay now. Life is full of laughter, life is full of love. Living in yeah. America. This was really something big. <laughs> you could be the other hooker. All right, fine. Give me the trash you want to write. <laughs>